threw everything else in. <laughs> Blue. I know. All right. I'm going to call the uh, Town Council FY22 budget work session on April 15th to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is citizens forum. If there's any citizens that, uh, Carolyn, do you have the notice? Can you read the notice, please? Mm -hmm. Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting and we welcome your participation. By attending, you acknowledge that this session is recorded and aired live on QAC TV 7. Dur during the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. The scheduled agenda is available on the information table just outside. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The Town Council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely and in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we'll refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. Thank you. If there's any citizens that would like to uh, make comments, we've got three minutes. Please come forward. All right, Carolyn, do we have anybody that had sent emails in specifically for Not public for comment? No. All right, hearing none, we're going to move into the discussion. Uh, final operating draft, I think, is the first agenda item. Karen, do you want to take the lead on this or start yeah, us off? So, um, in your packets, um, the second sheet, I just kind of did an overview of what changes were made from last work session to this one. So th these will be the changes you see encumbered in the, the sheet behind it. So we, we uh, updated the allocation of cost from 20 to 35%. We changed the PUT rate from seven to 13 per hundred of assessed value with a 50-50 split to the permanent fund and the general fund. Um, in the general fund, when I did the capital, um, when I pulled all the numbers in from the spreadsheet, the one at the very top that said Pennsylvania design, I totally left it on the sheet. So I have added it in to this sheet. It wasn't in the last one. Um, we received bids for waste removal, recycling and yard waste. So um, the increase from fiscal year 21 to 22 is 55,197.92. Of that, um, we had put a 10% increase in at the last one, and so now we've only put the difference in between that 10% and what it actually is, which was like 26,000. Um, and so removing the tax differential put the general fund in the negative $555,228. Um, the enterprise fund, same thing, raised the allocation from 20 to 35%. Um, we added the project management in discussion. Um, it was 350,000 over the three and a half fiscal years. We've added the 100,000 in for the first fiscal year. And we've added 2,847,500 in capital projects. So as far as the American Rescue Plan Act, the total funds received is for, will be 4,132,181, half soon and half a year later. Um, 350 in total project management, but after this fiscal year, we'll have 250,000 left. Uh, 2,719,790 in approved capital, so that leaves a remaining balance in the American Rescue Plan funds of 1,062,391. Does anybody have any questions <coughs> on that? Okay. All right, so the next part of your packet is the operating budget with all the changes um, from all the work sessions. And so I don't know if you, Tim, do you want to see if each of you has questions? Is there anything, any discussion you want on the operating budget at this point? Well, I think that, you know, we need to address the uh, proverbial elephant in the room. Right? <laughs> now, based on what we had last week and after the meeting with the county commissioners this week, we've got a transfer to fund balance in the negative of $555,000. And so I think that, uh, you know, we need to talk, the council needs to discuss and figure out what we're going to do, right? I, I, I think we've had a lot of very good, lively discussions about uh, this council being the ones that are going to fix the problems and, and that are going to say the buck, you know, buck stops here and that we've got to go forward. So, you know, I will entertain any council members who want to have a discussion on, on what we want to do. Well, speaking just for myself. <laughs> Stereo. I know. I thought mine was up. Sorry, I don't need to hear myself twice. Um, <laughs> neither does anybody else. Uh, I think we have to 
go back through the capital budget. Um, you know, I, I was disappointed in the decision of the county commissioners uh, Tuesday evening, and I think that displeasure was pretty clear to them, but they are faced with a, a political decision, and they made it. So I think we now have to come back. Before we talk about the revenue side, I think we have to talk about the expenditure side and some of the things that we have included in the capital budget, thinking we were going to be keeping the differential. I think we have to go through there and, and perhaps make some difficult choices about what we retain there and what we do not retain. So in the back of your packets, um, after page 33 of the operating budget, you'll see two summary pages of the capital if you wanted to skip to look at that first. It's got highlighted green and yellow, yeah. One's for the general fund and one's for the enterprise fund. Um, the first page should be the general fund. So what's highlighted in yellow are the operating um, increases that were approved and they're already within the budget. What's in the green is the capital. Have we heard anything yet about the uh, grant funding for the wharf possible parking lot or any of that? No, we won't hear about that one probably until um, May. It's after the um, public works meets legislatures the done. legislature yeah right go ahead does any other council member agree we ought to go through this or I, absolutely yeah i do too so the the thing that strikes me is i'll just start off i guess is sixty thousand dollars for pennsylvania avenue comments on that that's the future if we do eliminate that I think um, we're being very short-sighted all three of our buildings are our principal buildings two of them are in disrepair and are antiquated and insufficient for our employees if we decide not to go forward and at least see what the future could bring and move the town of Centerville into the 21st century with at least the design. Uh, all our employees have provided, the directors have provided to Steve all the space requirements and needs. And I think it's a very important uh, item in our capital budget. And it's small compared to what it could be in the future, but it is a start. And if we don't, it's very short-sighted. Our employees will be suffering because they'll know, well, we're stuck. So I think it would be, from my personal opinion, it would be short-sighted. Um, and uh, I think we gotta look to the future. I agree with Bob. I think we need to leave it in there. Even if we do it, nothing says we have to build a building tomorrow. We can build it two or three years down the road. It doesn't have, I or still think longer. it needs to be even done. Even further, even further. Oh yeah. yes, even further. I still think it needs to be done. I think it needs to be done, but I don't know if it has to be done this year. I mean, we have a lot of money here that we have to figure out a solution for. This is not a tenth of it. If we're not <laughs> gonna do this for two or three years, couldn't we push off the design plan? Yeah, but in two or three years, it might be $100,000 to do. So what I would say is I look at the wharf, right? So the, the town put together a plan. We had some money to, to put together a plan for uh, building out the wharf. Uh, we didn't have the money at the time to actually do it, but we put the plan together knowing that at some point in the future, this was going to happen. Uh, we were fortunate enough over time, over several years later, to actually get the money uh, to actually do most of the work via grants. And I think that had we not gotten the plan together, we would the, the wharf would not look like what it is now. I mean, and there's people down there all the time. I think it's one of the greatest assets that we have. So, you know, I, I, I don't look at this as a 
two to three year thing. I, I think it might be a little bit further out than that, but I do think that it's important to have the plan. Um, so I, I mean, I think that this, this should probably stay in. Uh, Kip's not here. I mean, I, if we don't, if there's not half a million dollars to be gained here, then the only solution seems to be revenue side. I mean, I think, you know, if you, we look back on the binder capital budgets, there was a prioritization of one, two, three, four, right? Yep. I mean, it'd be easy enough to say ones and twos are in, see where we are if we exclude threes and fours in terms of priority. We can certainly do that. You know, I, I think that, I think we need to look at the revenue side. Right, I mean, the, the majority of these things, whether they're ones, twos, or threes, have been pushed off for so long, uh, they're going to need to be done. And if we don't get these ones done now, the other things like repairing roads, I mean, if you look at that, what we were given here about some of these roads that are going to need to be repaired just in the streets alone, right? Forget about the water and the, the sewer. O over the next several years, it's $1.6 million. That's in today's dollars. That's probably more like $2 million. That's not even taken into account the cracking that we've got and the uh, other problems that we've got. And then Northbrook is going to need to get redone. You know, so there's we've had a revenue problem for a long time, and and we need to solve that revenue problem. I think we had we we thought that we had it done with the county commissioners getting the differential for this year, and and you know that that's not going to happen. So I think that. <clears throat> We need to look at revenues. Uh, I will say that I, I did a little, little, little bit of looking today, and I'm happy to pass this out to the council members. Um, tax rates over time. One for you at Shelby. I only got a few here. I just need one, and I'll pass the rest of these out. So these are towns that I looked at from going back to 2005 uh, up, to, up to today. Um, I chose Annapolis, Cambridge, Centerville, Chestertown, Denton, Easton, Elkton, Greensboro, Herlock, Salisbury, and St. Michael's. They're not all the same, right? I mean, Annapolis and Salisbury are, are huge towns. Um, one of the things that's common in all of these is that these towns all provide considerable services. I looked at ones that had police, police protection, their own police departments. If you look at this chart, the only two from 2005 till now that have gone down are Centerville and St. Michael's. All, every other town has gone up uh, in for, for their for their real tax rates. You know, if you if you look at the the revenue, even if we were just flat the entire time, uh, the revenue loss is going to take care of a lot of these projects that we should have done, or a lot of the capital things that we approved already. Um, so you know, I I just I think this is something that we need to discuss and. I'm happy to look at capital too, but everything on the capital budget is a, is a, is a necessary thing. And I think you, the council, you know, recalls you know the letter we sent to the county commissioners. I mean, it's uh, between you know the current fiscal year 22 and and fiscal year 23. You know, the total amount of money that's just related to what's been kicked down the road from 2016 to 2020. We didn't even, I didn't even count, when I put those numbers together, I didn't count what was included in 21 or 22's request. I only focused on the five years that nothing's been done, and it was like $16 million worth of projects. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. I mean, I know when we've all talked before, I mean, you know, you've come in new and um, it'd be nice if some of this stuff had been done little by little and not hit you all, you know, at I'm, one time. Personally, I was very disappointed in the deaf ear that was given to our request. I believe as, well, Commissioner Dunhamill said, we were elected to move forward. He said if the town of Centerville Council wanted to do what take the money that would be our accountability and I believe that we wouldn't be talking here tonight if the county commissioners had not gone back on their word 
their word was, you pick. Do you want the tax differential returned? Or do you want it given to the town? We wrote a very concise, professional discussion and argument for the return. And it's not any willy-nilly. It's not, we're not gold plating anything here in the town. These are not needs. These not, well, wants. These are needs, excuse me, I get my needs and wants mixed up. These are needs. Our people are operating daily with trucks, equipment, literally held together with duct tape and bailing wire. We, it is costing us money if we don't rehab the shed out at the water facility. It's putting our employees at risk. It's costing money, extra money, to do the job right. I'm emphatic about it. I am disappointed that five elected officials disapproved what they said we could do. It was, and we worked very hard for this, this budget. I applaud all the employees that put this together. Steve, Karen, Crystal, Chief Joe, Carolyn, Kip especially. They did their professional best and I support them. And I think the town of Centerville, the citizens should realize, like Steve just said, Walls, that there's been a lot of stuff kicked down the road. And I'll just say, it was kicked down the road. Oh, we can't raise taxes. Okay? Well, sometimes the chickens come home to roost, people. And in 2021, with the fiscal year 2022 budget, the chickens are here. Now, are we gonna make the hard decision? Are we gonna not let the town operate efficiently, professionally, and provide the services that our citizens expect? I, for one, expect it. And anytime somebody says, I'll cut your taxes, my comment is, oh, what do you want to cut in services? And these two capital budgets do not have any fat. And I will stop. And I thank my employees, because they did a good job and they've been here longer than I have, and I respect their professionalism. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, so we're at a deficit now. If we just look at what the budget is currently of 555,000. <clears> if we were to bridge that gap, just covering it, that would be 10 cents on the, on the tax rolls. We don't have other, ex well, there's gonna be other expenses coming down the pike next year, right? We, if we're, if there's gonna be a step, if there's gonna be a COLA, if there's gonna be purchases that we do on an annualized basis, even small things like a, a lease for, uh, you know, a lease for the, for the cameras, um, possibly going in and getting the police uh, uh, pensions, right? That's gonna be- Oh, LEOPs, that, That's yes. gonna be uh, expensive as well. So I, I think that, Having had to do this before, you should do it once and do it the way that you need to do it so you don't have to do it again. So I think that we need to probably go higher than 10 cents uh, in order to make it solid uh, for the future. So I'm happy to hear if anybody else has anything they want to say. I, I think it's, you know, this is um, 
we've, we've got the second of two utility fee increases coming next summer. We have, and those are appropriate, we have a, a pandemic still ongoing. And so this just, it's tough. It's tough stuff. I mean, it's uh, no question about it. I mean, I, I guess if I'm being completely honest, if we're going to talk about raising taxes, I think the the purely the optics, which perhaps is the wrong reason to make this decision, but the optics of talking about you know with with all the deferred maintenance that we're talking about coming over the coming in over the next few years and really forever. To be talking about new buildings is, I just get hung up on that. And I, I appreciate Council Member Hardy's thoughts, and I, and I tend to agree. Uh, I just get hung up on the, the not being the absolute best stewards of that dollar that we possibly can and saying, this is not essential, right? It is, it is there are things in this capital budget that are absolutely essential right? i agree with that but i think we just need to go through i mean i've i've ridden around town and kip's chevy trailblazer is getting kip a new truck essential my opinion is it's not there may be four votes that don't agree with me but that's just my opinion and i i, I think we owe it to the taxpayers if we are going to say we need more revenue then we ought to be spending that revenue on just the absolute essentials and as i look through the list as i take the tours of the town the you know sixty thousand dollars is just the first bite of what is going to wind up being a pretty big apple uh, down there on pennsylvania avenue so that's all i think i'll just stop with that maybe So if we, again, if we look at years going forward, we've got a plan to replace a vehicle for the police department, right? Uh, the retirement's gonna cost a considerable amount of money. I think we're all committed to uh, getting and, and retaining the best quality employees that we can have. Additional capital is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, I mean, I, I've gone through this before. This is the hardest thing that, that uh, an elected official has to make, but I, I do believe, as Bob, as you had said, and as we discussed in the council or the commissioners meeting the other day, this council was elected to solve these problems. And if you look at the the differential, and I think it's been fantastic for the for the commissioners to realize that there is dual taxation, that the council should have been raising those rates because we had those needs ever since it happened and that's that was one of the goals of of that i had had in the beginning and i couldn't get another council to agree to that so uh, i mean i think we need to go between you know 12 and and 14 cents is, is where i think we need to be i mean I'm, i don't perhaps it's splitting hairs to say there's no difference i'm probably arguing against myself here and i, I am there's no difference in a 13 cent tax rate increase and keeping the differential. A decision that we already made. I mean, functionally speaking, what the county commissioners did Tuesday is to pass the buck to us. You no, said it. Yeah. No way to candy coat that. And so that's what they did. So um, I'm I'm all in on tough decisions and buck stop them with us so. So do you have a recommendation of, of what it should be I'm curious what Shelby and Jeff think I mean we were I think the county commissioners were talking about 13 their proposal was 11 and change 1176 yeah but Something. they said they were raising it they were being benevolent yeah, yeah. they to were 13. gonna give us 13 with a 2% inflation per year I mean when when the people sitting out here over the last number of years, they've done a very realistic analysis that for a number of years, am I right, Tim, it's always been like 17, 18 cents for, I don't know how long, five, six years. And now, oh, 
We've been giving you 11 cents. Uh, that's okay. And, uh, oh. Oh. we'll give you 13 cents next year. All right, let's not beat up on the Kenan Commission. No, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm let's just saying. Discuss the, the, yeah. the point what I'm saying here. The thing is, is we've had a shortfall, and you've mentioned this for a number of years, because of what the county commissioners have not been giving us. Well, it, it's, the, the council has decided that every year not to take the not to take I, any of the. No, revenue. I understand. So, so yeah, so this is the year that they that we asked them for it, and they said no. Shelby, do you have any comments on on? You know, yeah, what? I mean, this is a tough decision to make, and looking through everything, I don't see a solution without bringing in more revenue. Unfortunately, um, I agree with uh, Steve Klein about you know, making sure whatever we do decide to put in this operating capital budget, it needs to be a necessity. And I also have some trouble with the Pennsylvania Avenue space design. I realize that that is something that needs to happen, but I just don't know if it needs to happen right now. Um, that being said, I agree that we do need to raise taxes. And if that's 13 cents, okay. I think about it. Oh, there's only two ways you can solve it. You either got to cut services or you have to raise taxes. I hate to say it. I mean, you, that's the way it's got to be done. So, but the $60,000, I'm still, there's a whole lot of other things I think we can cut besides the $60,000. Like there's, there's some other things I'm looking at, but I'm, I'm still for the $60,000 to do the, for the future. I, I'm, I'm. We're still kicking the can down the road. If we take the sixty thousand dollars out, that's just my thoughts. And if we do the thirteen, right, as as Steve, as you had said, that's same as the, what the differential was going to be, including all the capital that we've got. So it offsets. So I mean, I'm I'm as hard as it is. I think I think thirteen is a is the number we should go with. Do you want to do a vote or you want to have consensus or does anybody else have any comments on on what it's what they think it should be and jeff just mentioned the capital budget i've mentioned it shelby's mentioned i mean do do we want to go back through that and sure have consensus again or do we want to i mean if if for me if we're going to raise taxes i feel compelled to go back through that document yeah. and see where we are in terms of consensus because that's fine. Okay. So I'm looking at the general fund, Karen. Is that yep, is the that what first page? Here? Yep. All right. Is everything general funds on that one page? So if you want to look at the start at the green, and we can just go line by line. All right. So I think we've decided on the, the Pennsylvania Avenue. There's three of us that have said that we want to leave that in there. Uh, next, we've got vehicles. I'm in on replacing. I, I think that's that truly is. Uh, two that, police vehicles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, silly to not do. Yes. Agreed. Um, the 4000 for the body cam release, we're in a lease. You know, we get a portion of that, that covered by grant, but that's what's remaining. Okay. Speed camera trailer replacement. We have had an issue on Liberty Street. Speeding, coming off the traffic light. I understand there's been a couple of incidents just in the past year where somebody had a step lively and if a speed camera trailer will maybe uh, get people thinking hey i better slow down what's what is the value of a uh, yeah. incident so we had one of these a while back and it and it did uh, it did it did break and it was it is unrepairable and I'll tell you, when we had it, the data that we got was tremendous. I mean, it helped us in certain areas to say there's not actually speeding going on here, and then it's helped us in other areas. In fact, what it, one of the things that absolutely helped us to do is back when I first got on the council, the bridge to bridge was 35 miles an hour, and that speed that speed camera uh, trailer that we had was instrumental in proving to the uh, to the state highway that that there were there there was considerable speeding there. Uh, I would say one of the you know, biggest complaints, and, and Chief, you can tell me if I'm wrong, uh, is people are speeding all over the place, right? And, and the, the ability to deploy something like this is, uh, it, it's well worth it. I'm fine with it. Okay. 
Drug team? Remember that. Yep. Yep. We're, We're all good, good with, with? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one thought. Uh, I'm going to ask the chief. For the d drug team, is there state, federal grant money, maybe? I'm just throwing that out. I'm, I'm for it. But is there other source of money, possibly? Legit does offer. In fact, I was looking at grants today. We'd applied for a couple grants today, one of which was the, um, the body-worn camera grant. Um, and legit specifically does offer a training grant up up to I believe it was twenty thousand um, dollars. I would have to see if a if a canine training, a subsequent training, or any monthly training because our canine teams have to train. They have to have two days of two days a month to train. Could be covered under that. Um, but this is where relationships with our community. Um, or different businesses that could support our K-9 team uh, and our local drug task force can also support this K-9 team. Um, as mentioned in the last budget hearing, the, the $20,000 to start this new K-9 team covers everything from front to back as far as vehicle upfit for a K-9, um, all, all the equipment, the purchase of the dog, the initial training of the dog, the initial training of the handler. Uh, so really, this is an investment that is turnkey with this price tag. That total cost is reduced dramatically once this team is upfitted and, and trained. The, the uh, monthly training that they, that they attend is free. Um, as I mentioned at the last hearing, we, we we're fortunate enough that we have a canine trainer on staff with us. Uh, which I think is is a great oversight and a great great way for for these guys to get additional canine training. Um, so this is a very this is a one time expense that's going to be very low maintenance in years to come, and and we'll get probably we could get potentially nine to ten years out of this canine team. <coughs> Shelby, how do you feel? I'm for it. For it. Yeah. All right, dump body. My only question is, how many other we we purchased a dumper bed this this year, right? We purchased a dump truck in December. How many other dump trucks do we have other than this one? Uh, we have, I think, probably about three of the smaller one-ton. This particular uh, body um, is for the large dump truck that we have, and of course, you saw the the pictures. Yeah. Um, That's the one with this rusted out. Completely, completely rusted out. I mean, that's that's typically the the truck that we would normally like to get our uh, staff trained, get CEL licenses. We can't even take that truck because it doesn't pay. You know, it, it wouldn't pass the walk around oh, inspection okay. at, by MVA because of all the rust. So, okay, um, it's fine. Anybody have any questions about that? Spray tank? The, uh, the spray tank, um, I mean, that was just to try to get a little bit larger tank for efficiency. I mean, they could still try to work with the smaller tank. And it's just here, $6,000, it's not anywhere else? Right. Yep, just in the general fund. It'd be just in the streets, yeah. <clears throat> Would we have a functioning spray tank now? We have a smaller one, yes. Smaller. Okay. And I'd be okay with scrapping that. Yeah. Scrapping that one. Uh, let's start a list of what we're eliminating, and we'll see what figure we add up to. That's a good idea. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Once we get to the bottom, I'll total it no, up. No. I think that would be. Yep. Okay. No, I agree. We there might, we go. Might might not be worth the squeeze. I agree. Okay. okay. So, spray tank is, yeah. is one that's going to start that list. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, we have this, this mini excavator is a $90,000 thing, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. $120,000. I was going to say, this is the one piece of equipment you cannot do without. Right. And we mean, did get um, the reimbursement from the backhoe fire, so 20 some thousand. 21000 I think. Yeah. Well, we have one now, right? I mean, we have an excavator now, don't we? We have a little mini excavator. Mini. 
<laughs> but we need to have a larger one because now we don't have the backhoe has the longer boom reach, to reach, and it's gone. So we need, you know, we need to have the larger one. I mean, we had planned to do something like this long term anyway. It just so happened the backhoe just, you know, sort of accelerated <laughs> getting the, the replacement. Yeah. I think the mini excavator we have now only reaches, I want to say it's either eight or seven or eight feet where a new mini excavator will probably be 10 to 12 feet in the ground. And I think as we share with you on the tour, I mean, it's, it's got some costs it's getting ready to incur on it as well. So, yeah. you know, it's an op opportune time to, you know, trade it in, get as much money as we can, you know, on the sales like we've done recently. Yeah. You know, because we did, we did recently get like close to $75,000 in um, equipment that we used equipment. Oh. So, so there is that possibility we could recoup some some cost for that. I'm a. This is a fool's errand. This is a fool's errand. <laughs> I'm fine with it. All of it. I mean, I, I'm I'm okay. No, no, I'm, 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 I agree. You know, your, to your point, I think you're trying to make. We're going to get to the bottom of this thing, and we're going to have twenty grand in a pot. You know, which doesn't. <laughs> reduce the impact and I think we just I mean I, I've changed at least my mind that <laughs> we don't have to go through this I don't mean to keep anybody else from going through it but I at least am fine with this I mean we, like, we've like we've for, made these decisions already I mean for instance when we got to the sidewalk fund I was going to say we still have some money in the sidewalk fund but there is an awful lot of trip hazards out there that we haven't gotten to yet and the purpose of this 30 was to keep trying to replenish some money so we continue to have a lot of money to work on these sidewalks, but but that would have been one I would have been. Anybody else have anything to defer? If you want to keep keep going through this, or are we good? Okay. All right. So going back to uh, revenues, thirteen is, is what the number is that would make the difference between what the county is saying, and then hopefully. Providing enough for uh, future uh, needs as well. Should we go any any lower than that? Any higher than that? Anybody have any comments on that? Thirteen seems fun. That would uh, <laughs> I don't want to say it's coincidence, but it equals what the tax differential yes. that the county commissioners have proposed. To, to give back to our citizens. Okay. So it's, some people might say we're being taxed doubly, but I look at it like it's a neutral in that. On all sets the other. They're getting the 13 cents back from the county commissioners because it's not coming to us. Well, I, I, no, I, no, I I'm just saying. It, 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 I, 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 th I agree with you, Steve, that, um, and I get back to applauding our uh, employees that uh, they did a very good job, and we have done a very good job, what, four weeks now? So. I, I would just add that the, you know, the graph that Council President McCluskey gave out you know, it does reflect that there are no towns except for St. I can't tell these colors, but I'll take your word for it. It's St. Michael's uh, that are going down. And it's also worth noting that all, except for either Salisbury or Chestertown, uh, started from a much lower baseline threshold. I mean, so not only are they going up, they started higher to begin with. And, you know, if you want to fund I mean, I believe, I believe this from the campaign trail. If you want to fund, if you want excellence, you have to fund it. So I think this, you know, I think this is good. Good. So 13 cents, is that a consensus, Shelby? Yes. Uh, Karen, can you redo the budget and add in 13 cents? Yep. And then, uh, Carolyn, whatever you need to do in terms of advertisements and public hearings, and we will have those. Um, should we move on to, I think we did the final capital draft, we did that already, and then mm -hmm. street priorities, do we want to discuss that? Can I ask, are we, do we want to, this is the last scheduled work session, 
Are we going to want to have one more to review the final numbers? Do we need to have a public hearing for the tax rate, right? Yep. That will be May 20th. And that it, it's scheduled for May 20th. I, 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 I think I would agree with Karen. Uh, that way we can see it in black and white. And it shouldn't be a long workshop in my... No. I mean, I could e whatever you prefer. I could e send it. Do we have a meeting on May, whatever the next meeting is in May. Six. Six. Why don't we do it a half hour before? Uh, if everybody yeah. can make that at, at 6.30 or... We could even say six o'clock in case there's further discussion. I mean, I think, I think just seeing it in black and white, and, and I believe we could spend as much time as we need, right? But I, I also think that we've pretty much made our decisions. Okay. Right. So can we do it for, do you guys think a half an hour would be enough? We met at 6.30 on the first uh, Thursday in May? I think so. You good with that? Okay. I just have a request as we're talking about final black and white version of this budget. If there is any way we can put together something that is easily digestible for the public to see, I mean, to, to look at, because this is a this is a not uncomplicated thing to look at, right? And, and I think a lot of times what we do when we post um, we post the two summary pages, and it just it, the revenues at the top. You can see where the the sources are, the expenses are at the bottom, and then they can see the bottom line. But I think it would even be good to have, I'm thinking of like a, I don't, I'm not trying to create work for you, but uh, some historical information to show what is happening with revenues. Because when I, you know, when I'm out on the campaign trail, I just assume that property values are going up. And so revenues should be going up sort of generally in that same direction. But the I think it'd be good to have some easily digestible historical information. Revenues are kind of, you know, they're for all intents and purposes pretty flat. Based on this, 40 cents. The, but expenditures are going up, you know, far outpacing. I think some of the information about, you know, what that this is not some windfall. When the the salary study, and the step increases, it's not some. It, you know, <laughs> incredible windfall for the staff. I think just putting our budget in perspective, that this is not a fiscal, I mean, to Bob's point, right, that this is not a fiscally irresponsible budget, that we are first trying to put the town back together and have that in a visual way where we can communicate it to people so it's not just these numbers on a page, maybe you know, stuff like this. You know, this, this thing that Tim handed out, I mean, I, I, to me, this is visual and easily to, easy to understand. The other things here, maybe not so much. And well, I think um, like graphs. Yeah. <laughs> but I think our decision to have the salary study, both for all the employees, and then Chief Joe's study regarding police um, retention of our employees is not just a, a nicety. Because if we don't retain people, if you get new people, all of a sudden you've got cost. they got to be trained, brought up to speed. Exactly. Well, I think, to, I think, Steve, to your point, I think it'd be relatively easy to take what our numbers were compared to the others that we looked at and put those in a color-coded, nice little right. thing. Yeah. I mean... I think that's a good idea. For the second. Right. Low second one here. Same that's just that's same just tax rate. So if yeah. you produce that same graph for, yeah. you know, what we pay our police officers versus what every other county. I mean, yeah. Joe's exactly. kind of already done the work, right? I mean, you. Yeah. And it'll show you the same story over and over again. Right. I suspect. So, it's not going to make it a less bitter pill for anybody to swallow. But. I can help with graphs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with pivot tables. We'll see pie charts. I, I can. Yeah. <laughs> We'll make right, it happen. We'll get, we'll get that stuff. We'll make it happen. All right, I guess the final thing on the agenda here is street priorities. So the last page of your packet, you will see um, Kip's list of street priorities. Um, he listed them in priority order and description on the side in the cost per department, streets, wastewater, and water. 
And I think part of the, the purpose of what the council was trying to see is because you had some money that was still left in the uh, recovery funds that was in, say, for fiscal year 23 <coughs> or, or further out uh, in the year after. Um, this is, you know, to give you at least a, a sense of some of the other larger street projects, you know, that uh, have been on the books. And Whedon is in, in um, FY22. Right. So, so you know, if you just took the, you know, the recovery funds, you know, on the surface, saying it's it's definitely water and wastewater qualifies, you know, anything in these columns that show water wastewater, you know, would certainly take up, you know, part of the, uh, um, you know, the remaining million dollars, you know, that that Karen said was was left after what you've already earmarked. Um, the street side, you know, that is where the general fund would pick up the tab, so. I mean, I, I firmly believe that we should be at a point or getting to a point where every year something is getting fixed, right? Every year a new road, we, we've done a lot, right? And we've done every major collector road in town has been done. Uh, but the side streets, all of that stuff, they're in, they're in really bad shape. So, I mean, I, I like the priorities. I see that I'm glad that we're getting number one done. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to, you know, if, if you're talking about getting it in this fiscal year or using the rest of that money in, in FY23, I think that's probably a good plan uh, to do. Yeah, if you could, uh, you know, see it in your in your numbers to to make the 477,000, of course, that's just an estimate, you know, um, if you could, you know, have that in your sites for fiscal year 23 and, and use... Uh, because it is one of the more expensive ones uh, on the list, um, then, uh, you know, that certainly would be uh, beneficial to at least maybe get that one done, you know, in the following fiscal year. And, uh, and I think, you know, as you all have, have mentioned on more than one occasion, um, that's just these projects here that have been on the books for a while. You know, when you keep talking about, you know, the North Brooks, and the Symphony Villages, you know, their 20 year anniversary is coming up and we've already been in Symphony and done crack seal. You know, there's certainly a lot of places in Northbrook that should already be addressed now. Um, not counting waiting two or three more years. So, you know, it's, it's all catching up, you know, and the cycle's starting over. I mean, I, as driving around town, I can see all the crack seal work that's been done. It looks like somebody took a mad, big magic marker and went down the streets. And I, I would hope our citizens would realize that um, they, they ride it every day around town. So this, right, it's just for the record, this is why I don't want to build a building. <laughs> I mean, you know, the things that you just outlined are, are why. I mean, I know town hall and I know uh, the police department and the wharf are not ideal, but this this rolled up, never ending, fix something every year, to me, doesn't leave room for a new building. So, even at this tax rate. Well, um, I'm just, my final word on new building. I am flabbergasted that we have a police department in a, totally inadequate building for them to be do their job for the safety and protection of our citizens. Um, I, and that was one that was the impetus that uh, G Chief Joe and I were talking about it. And then I brought it up to Steve Walls and the whole idea of, and then Steve was mentioning all the other buildings that are in various states of disrepair. Um, I wouldn't want to be Crystal sitting at my desk and having water drip on my head. I mean, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic or anything. It, th this is reality. And um, uh, yes, the building if we have other needs, but I think we have to at least plan for it. And, and if, we, if we don't plan for it and think to the future, we are not being uh, 
good, I want to say, servants of the people in the town of Centerville. And I think we've done, and I'm going to praise us again, I think the five of us, with all the support of the employees of the town of Centerville, we've done an excellent job in these, what, hmm, seven months? All right, anybody else have anything they want to add? I was going to go move to Centerville, or to uh, Citizens Forum. Citizens Forum, second time for Citizens Forum. Is there anybody that wants to come up and have their three minutes? Please come up and uh, introduce yourself, sit down, and talk to the microphone. You don't know where I am, right? You've still got to announce it, though, please. I know who you are. Good to see you back again, Joe. Yeah, well, I've been recuperating from my knee operation, but I'm getting there. Uh, it's Joe Brown. I live on uh, Concerto Avenue in Centerville. And I'm a, um, disappointed I haven't been able to come before. Um, as you know, we used to participate in these meetings quite regularly, a bunch of us from Symphony Village. Um, so I just heard you talking tonight about the differential, and so I understand is the county not doing any differential? Is that the, is that the issue? Or? So, in, so the county came to the town and said, this is at a COG meeting, every other town, every other municipality takes the entire amount of the differential that they're given in cash. They don't give it as a, there's one other town, Millington, I believe, is no, the other town that, that no, takes Millington, it, but they're, totally. it's a very small amount. Totally. Yeah, but they're all small. They, they came to the town and said, you know, you guys should let us know what you want to do. Let us know by the, by the second week in April. And the council voted that we wanted this year, we wanted the differential. On Tuesday night, they called us into their commissioner's meeting and they voted to not let the town have the differential, that the entire differential is going to go back to the citizens in the form of a lower amount of taxes. So we'll see that on our tax bill like we have in past years. Correct. And their number, okay. the original number that they proposed was, I think, 11.7 cents. They yeah. moved it to 13, which Weren't is Weren't we up to like 15 bef nope. uh, uh, before? Yeah. No. I know they were inching it up, so, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm hearing about this salary study compensation. Uh, what, what, are we engaging uh, somebody in that field to... No, we've actually we've 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 done the, the salary study, and what the council has voted to do was to increase salaries uh, across the board on uh, in certain areas, public work, the police department, certain administration areas, uh, to get them competitive because we've had such a problem with turnover. Yeah, I thought I I read or heard somewhere recently that we had higher revenues than we expected, so we gave all the resident, I mean all the employees, an increase. That's is, part of the salary study. Is that what this is? Or well, was, well, there, was there other increase beside that? I'm pretty sure that's that's it now. January 1st, we did the police, the police department, and the, and that was it. So the other, uh, another big question is the sewer, the sewer plant, right? It's got to be replaced eventually. We're coming to the um, maximum. We're expanded, getting, expanded. Yeah, expanded, right. Yeah, yeah. So... What do we have on the plan for that? I mean, we've already just added 50 cents for the next two years um, on the rate. We have a that's preliminary. Not gonna, that's not going to cover the. Uh, we have a preliminary engineering study that's in the works that Steve can speak it's, to. It's hopeful that we will have that ready um, at least by the second meeting in May. We just received a draft, so we're starting to review it. That'll provide us with our options in terms of, you know, what we what we have uh, in front of us with expansion. What it would cost to go to three quarters of a million, a million. And That's what it's going to cost. Now we have to worry about how we're going to fund it. No, no, no. That was the gallons per day. So what we're at oh. ha half a million now. So if we go to seven fifty, what it would cost to expand the plant that much? If we go to a million, what it would cost to expand the plant? So none of that money, that future cost, is in this budget yet. No, sir. Okay. So what is that going to mean? Another increase in water and sewer bills? I think it probably means, well, we're going to have to identify some grant funding. There's a tremendous amount of grant funding out there for yeah. uh, municipal sewer, sewer and water. So we're going to, I mean, my preference is to fund it with as much of that as we can, but we haven't talked about that as a council. And, and that's one of the reasons, not specifically, that we're, that we're uh, adding money to the budget for project managers possibly to go out there and, uh, look for that kind of stuff. Okay. You, you say to the project manager? Correct. Do we have one now? 
We don't, but we're funding a project. We're, we're funding project management expense in the budget for the next. Is it going to be a subcontractor? Yeah. Okay. So the last thing is uh, hearing about this uh, you know, potential move or municipal building over to Pennsylvania. Have what have we done about that in a way of study or? It doesn't seem to be many people in town know about that. Um, is a sixty thousand dollar design study in this budget? I see that. I see sixty thousand. That's for the That's, study. What's the study so, for? What's the study going to be? Planning, our, I guess, a design study. What it's, we can do. It my, my concern, thoughts. my concern about Pennsylvania, that's that's a prime retail spot, and I just take to see a municipal building put there. And I think, number one, I think the town needs to know more about what's going on. I, people don't know about this. Before we start spending a lot of money, I think we need to let the town know what's coming down the road. Joe, uh, would you have a, a preference of uh, an area that possibly? A building of this, uh, we don't even know what the footprint will be of the building. It will be a multi-story building. Well, I mean, you could throw I mean, a lot of different thoughts, but um, I mean, the the property has the potential for being big enough that we could actually put a put two pad sites on there. That, that's the potential, right? So a, a building yeah. for the town and a pad site possibly for retail and apartments on it. And that way the town the town owns the property. We could actually sell that. I know that. we own that street, but I just hate to see us put a, it's a good retail area. We've already got retail on one side with apartments up top. There's a demand for apartments. I just hate to see us put a municipal building there. It doesn't have to have that kind of visibility. So I just think we need to research that a little bit. Want to have an idea, Joe? Of, what's that? About uh, apartments. Uh, our current county is reviewing what to do with the Board of Education over on Broadway. It's being floated that possibly they will be building a new school Board of Education out by the high school. And, I just if, think and hold it. And if they do that, uh, that building is within the town limits, yeah. the Board of Ed on Broadway. S a good thing would be develop that for both first year and first responders, first year teachers and responders, put that building back on the tax rolls. Repurpose it. If you look at the real property search for the town, the town owns a lot of property in this. I don't even know where they all are without going out and trying to look at them, but there's lots of um, different property. In any event, I just think number one is you need to let the town know what you're doing. People are getting unaware, and we're, you're going down a road, and you know there may be some people really upset the fact that you're moving out of this dark building. Um, you may hear. hear so so I'll, I'll put this out to anybody that's out there, right? And I think council members would agree with me. If they want to take a, a tour and they want to see some of the things that we're dealing with, whether it's things dripping on our heads because of well, leaks, I'm not saying. Or that. Oh, no, let me just finish, right? Or the, the you know the rusted pick uh, the the rusted uh, um, dump, truck. dump trucks that we have. I'm happy to show them no, out I know. There. I mean, I've sat in these hearings, and I know about the trucks. We keep paying, kicking them down the road. A lot of these things get kicked down the road. But this is a major a major change to the town, yep. and yep. I think people ought to That's be knowing that. That's why you elected a new council. That's even in the pipeline there being thought about. Do you have the, a suggestion about question. how to get it out there to the people? No. Do you have a suggestion about how to do that? No, that's your job. Okay. So one of the things we did have discussed is when the budget is all over, putting together a letter out to the people about why the decisions were made that we're going to make, and that's you know that's expensive, right? But we're but I think I didn't catch what putting a letter out yeah. to to all the people in town about the reasons that we had to make the decisions that we had to make. So that will hopefully inform them. Well, if you're going to delineate the fact that you're looking at this new building, I think um, I hate to see us spend the money without. Until we know what we're doing for sure. The well, last question is: You don't get to know what you're doing until you you, you have a plan <laughs> study to figure it out. Is that plan transferable? I mean, does it have to be on Pennsylvania? Can no. it be somewhere else? No. Right now, okay. the design of the building is based on the space requirements of the police department, of our admin department, of our operations, and will be an asset to the town. So, is that available to the town now? That information. Could I go out in the letter? We just, okay, I, I'm just this, this idea down, yes. just came up. What's that? He's talking about the space requirements. The space yeah. requirements. Yeah. This whole thing just, it's like Tim Thanks. just said. 
it's, it's not in a format to really share with the public because it's just preliminary information that the staff has provided that's going to be given to a consultant so they can the flush it out to see Architect. if anything that we've got yeah. on paper is anywhere close to what is accurate. So we, just, we, we are a long way from moving out of town yeah. hall yeah. Right. <laughs> and, well, we and a long way from building a building. Okay. Yeah. All right, the next thing is economic development. Uh, the budget went way up this year. Um, I think you guys, you, we're in the process of banding the Economic Development Committee. Kind of, def, um, we haven't had a meeting, and you, you know, we haven't been able to get a quorum for years. No, every Believe time me, that we I'm, have a I'm meeting, a Joe, Joe gets meeting. on him. <laughs> I go to like every meeting. I know it's been me and one other guy, and so Davis. Got, Davis comes. Well, it's on Zoom now, so it's not. Yep. So we've got cool. two paid professionals, Main Street and an economic development person who yeah. are actually going to go out, you know, who've, who. So who, what are we, uh, so we're not going to, we're going to leave the committee to, um, defunct and. The committee's going to, so I'm the liaison to see the, the committee will be ad hoc moving forward. So Just what that does, is it requires, it doesn't require town staff to be there at night. We don't have to be producing minutes. So I think it's still, I mean, in page and, uh, and Carol are doing fantastic work. Yeah, the budget went up. It looks to me like the budget went up, and, and it was like the function was starting to disappear. That's all I'm. The function is coming from the staff. Right. So the last thing, and I'll, I'll shut up, and I thank you for indulgency. Give me more than three minutes. On the <coughs> operating budget for wastewater and water, it's like the same thing. A lot of the same things are on those um, details here. Because the way we we work it from an accounting standpoint is part of the part of the cost is split in the water division and parts in the sewer division. So if you see the same item in yeah. in one box, it'd be the same item in the next box. Yeah, it's that's just the cost is just split. At. Yeah. Right. And and, and some of those part. some of those costs, um, uh, say, say for instance uh, a utility truck, um, you know it may be part of the cost is in the other page so that means it's on the general fund side like like there's forty thousand dollars in each one for the utility truck right so that means that the truck costs eighty thousand dollars it's it when you add the three between the two the added to, yeah, the, okay. between enterprise budget and the general fund yeah okay. the total cost between the two is the cost of the vehicle yes. all right thank you for your time all right is there anybody else that uh thank wants you to speak for citizens forum i'll take a motion to adjourn so a motion is there a second? second? All right, we got a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 We'll see you back here at 7 o'clock. Thanks, everybody.
to uh, convene the town council meeting of April 15th, 2021. If everybody would please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and then stand for a moment of silence for military, public safety personnel, past and present, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First, we're going to move into the review of the minutes from the past meetings, April 1st, 2021, a budget work session. I don't have any changes. Anybody else? Take a motion that we adopt the uh, minutes as presented. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Next, we've got meeting minutes from April 1st, 2021. I do not have any changes. Anybody else? Move that we adopt the meetings from, or the minutes from April 1st, 2021 as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the minutes from April 1, 2021, the regular meeting minutes. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Next, we have uh, April 8th, 2021, budget work session minutes. I do have one requested change under capital projects on the first page. First bullet, Mr. McCluskey stated that he was in favor of all requests, comma, last the cost of the farm. I would like to add in there to be discussed later on in the evening. If you could just add that phrase at the end of the sentence. Anybody else have any other changes? I'll move that we accept the minutes from April 8th, 2021 as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Next, we'll move into Citizens Forum. Uh, I think that the since the meeting is kind of already going, we don't need to read the uh, announcement again. But if there's any citizens that would like to, like to have their three minutes, you're welcome to come up. Ellen, do we have anybody that sent emails in specifically for this? All right, we'll move on next um, to... We did, but I'll wait until after the Carter Farm. I'll wait until the second one. For after. Okay, perfect. Uh, next, we're going to move into appearances. Ernie Soda, Soda Construction Services, and Rebecca Flora. Remake Group, Carter Farm Presentation. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi. 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 Hello. Sorry, let me put this up here for you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be looking Everybody's up here. It's not out of disrespect. Yeah, I just oh. want to have that problem. Are we good? Oh, oh, we're going to get a presentation. There we go. I'll just look at it that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're ready to go. We'll start? Yep. Okay, Denver, thank you. So, um, first of all, I want to thank you all for allowing us to present our vision for this uh, very important site in Centerville. You know, it has a long history, and um, I think we have a vision that would be a win-win uh, for both the residents who live there and for the uh, community at large. And, you know, it's always good to talk, and we appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm Ernie Sota, president of Sota Construction and uh, Green Development. We do about 30 to $35 million a year in construction and development, primarily in the, the Western Pennsylvania region. Uh, we are doing a uh, project in Washington, D.C. right now. And um, the, um, my background is that I studied architecture. Uh, after uh, graduating, I built a house for my parents up in the Laurel Highlands, where I now uh, reside, reside partially. Uh, that's uh, very close to Western Maryland. And, um, 
you know, after that, I worked for the Urban Redevelopment Authority in Pittsburgh. Then I worked for another construct, uh, construction company where the uh, largest project I handled was about $50 million. Started my own company in 1994. And uh, with a focus on client satisfaction, what I call total quality construction, and also sustainability. Uh, we're recognized as one of the leading green builders in the uh, Pittsburgh region. And uh, we do that for a number of reasons. Uh, we're interested in sustainability for quite some time. And that kind of led us uh, to this vision of an agri-hood uh, for this site, uh, which is you know a food-centered development. Uh, it's about local food. It's about local jobs, local economy. Uh, you know, back in the 50s, food, uh, uh, local food was about 80%. Now it's 3%. So we'd like to bring that back. And uh, I'll turn it over to Rebecca to introduce herself. Okay, hi. Um, good to see some of you again. We have um, basically been working on this for, for a couple of years. I think I've mentioned to you all in the past, I was here a couple of months ago, um, different location, but I live in, in Chestertown, and I've lived on the Eastern Shore about 10 years now. I'm vested. I'm here. I'm not planning on moving again. This is, this is it. <laughs> I love it here, growing up in the Adirondack Mountains. I feel like this is a slightly warmer version of being able to be close to nature here. And I'm um, really excited to be potentially working on something literally just down the road. So we're going to jump into this. Uh, the first thing I want to do, whoops, went the wrong way. What did I do wrong here? Oh, click on the... Carolyn. Okay, help me out. Okay, I think I'll just, this is safer. Maybe I'll just do this. <laughs> Man, that's nope, that's not safe either. What am I doing? Try the right at. Oh, oh, do I just do the arrows maybe? Yeah. That might be the simplest thing. There we go. There we go. Okay, we have Technology. given to you all um, a packet which essentially is a exact replica of what you're going to be seeing in the presentation. What we'd like to ask is we're going to stick to Steve's um, directive to try to do this in 20 minutes. Um, so we're going to move fast. Excuse my fast talking when we get through some of this, but we want to really use this as a backdrop for a conversation uh, to give you the, the overview in about 20 minutes. Um, these are the different sections of that. Obviously, we're going to focus most on the development concept. You have a full-size plan of that, and then there's actually one in the packet also, but we thought having that to look at as we go would be helpful. Um, and so those are the various sections that we're going to be focused on. and. Uh, go tag team style, move our way through it in about 20 minutes. So please just kind of jot down what questions you may have and things that you want to dig deeper into, because we're going to go high level as we go through this with the notion that we'll dig where you are most interested in digging down into. So why don't I do this, Aaron, okay. and you can, um, well, maybe I will. I'm all over the place with this arrow now. <laughs> Carolyn, is there an easier way to flip forward on this, or am I doing the arrow um, is the best way? Can you do a... Um, the little the middle one. Yeah. Oh, That's okay. the trick. Okay. Thank you. One little, one little. Got it. Okay. Okay. So in addition to our team, we have uh, Laguatra Bonsi Associates. They were uh, master planners with uh, Gibson's Grant and Easton Village. So they have a uh, good Eastern Shore experience. Uh, we also have uh, Ryan Showalter as our attorney for uh, approvals, entitlements, uh, advice. Um, we have uh, Fitz. Turner uh, is a consultant to uh, real estate. And then uh, Barry Griffith with Lane Engineering uh, is also on our team to assist us in uh, envisioning and engineering for this project. Is Barry here? Barry, you're back there. There's Barry, he's with us this evening. And mm -hmm. also want to point out uh, Sandy Huffer, who's one of our prospective buyers, is with us here this evening too. So we might call on them a little bit later. Um, Sandy's from here in Centerville, actually, lifelong resident. Okay, um, what am I? Yep, yeah, pull it, yep. Yeah. Okay, I will figure this out yet. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna do in five minutes, believe it or not, what I, I usually stand up a lot when I talk, so if you see me rolling around when I'm doing that. Um, in five minutes, what I have learned, and I am still learning as we try to really understand this special place here, and it really has been what's informed um, our thinking around the conceptual plan, and obviously, as a planner, I like to start out with understanding the people, the place, the culture. Am I too far now? Okay. Um, and that's what we've really tried to do in digging down um, and researching this. 
So obviously 2009, you did a community plan. You know that, I know that. Um, I think the big thing here is when you look at this little tiny piece of land comparative to the rest of these growth areas, um, it actually looks small in, in this context, but it's truly a jewel. And it's a really important part of your overall growth strategy, I think, for this town as a planner get that and we've really been digging into your documents to understand what your what your vision is we wanted to share this because it's just important of setting the, the the context and the background zoning obviously 2014 some of you were very involved in the zoning amendment that occurred back then as an observation for us once again the big observation is as a as a tnd um we're surrounded by R1, R2, and actually light industrial. And so with that infill, being respectful of our neighbors and understanding what's going on around us is a big part of something we have to think about. As far as the intents of TND, we think we meet all of the intents. And so I think we can absolutely, in the conversations we've had with the staff so far, um, meet that, particularly with this PUD overlay that we've been talking about um, um, already. The other big thing that we've learned from and are still learning um, is that in 2016, we are very grateful, um, as I'm sure you are, for the work that the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy uh, did to really try to identify a developer for this site. And in doing that, understanding what the community would like to see on that site. So I've been going through all the notes, reports, uh, the videos, talked to Katie. Um, Parks, actually, who headed up that process, she's with Preservation Maryland now, just understand as much as we possibly could about what the community was saying, um, because that informed everything. The assets amenities that were expressed at that time are ones that we treasure and we really want to ensure um, stay in place also with development, because that's what I think will attract others here and continue to make this place special. The really important thing um, are what I thought interesting as a planner was to go through and see in their reports what came out as five key priorities um, that came out of those community conversations. Access, preservation, agriculture, commercial, and housing. We've actually taken those and used them as a frame for, framework for defining our um, development concept. So as we dive into that, they're going to be framed around these things that the community said were their priorities for this particular site. And we're framing everything around that in terms of really showing how we're responding to these community priorities. Um, at the same time, while these are all the town values that we, we think, and that's just a snippet, and I know that that's a small part of everything else that the people here feel, um, but in the end, we really wanted to share with you also what our values are as developers, what we care and believe in. Uh, in the end, for me, and that is my little grandson there, um, it's all about thinking that everything we build has to be built with future generations in mind. And so our work that has always been based in sustainability and really not only preserving but restoring is, is, is foundational to how we think about the work that we do. And, and that's very real. I mean, you can talk to anybody that's worked with us. Um, it's very genuine. It's just who we are. So in addition to all of those plans, visions, discussions, we have to look at the physical context and the market conditions, which we also have done in, in our ability to really think about what can happen on this site realistically. Um, the first part of that is, oh, there we go. History, I had a wonderful history lesson. Um, it's funny, because I'm watching this Netflix show, um, Turn. I don't know if you've seen it. It's, it, it is like revolutionary war and, and I'm, I'm in that space. <laughs> uh, sorry, I usually stand. Um, talking about, I get excited about these things. Yeah, <laughs> it's like looking at the history, I got a hold of the heritage study. My neighbor, Elizabeth Watson, actually, uh, was the consultant involved in writing this study. And for the town, and really tracing back to 1670 um, with the original land grant, I mean, this site is so special from that standpoint, from a historical standpoint, that uh, that just got me even more excited about what we can do, I think, to, to really make the site something that really ties into that overall aspect of, of what Centerville is about. The other thing, of course, is physically to look at the context. You all know it. We had, we're getting to know it. 
But the way I like to do that as a planner is to think about what's a half mile walk radius from the site. And when you draw that line and see that everything that's within essentially, depending on how fast you walk, I walk very fast, but it's a um, 10 minute walk to be able to get downtown or for someone downtown to come here and maybe participate in some of the commercial that we'd like to have there or to stop on their way to the wharf during a, a lunchtime walk. So that whole notion of walkability and everything that's around us and then what's next to us in terms of you know, respecting those other adjacent uses was all part of what we're looking at in our, in our development concept. And um, Ernie's gonna say what he's discovered in terms of the existing conditions on the site itself. So we've, uh, you know, of course, walked the site many times. Uh, it's a really interesting site in many ways, uh, as Rebecca just pointed out. The, uh, the buffer zone, I think, is really the key area here in terms of the challenges that that presents, in terms of uh, the steep slopes, the soil types, and those sorts of things. You know, we have to be really careful about uh, stormwater management. We don't want to introduce the stormwater uh, into that area uh, during construction. Of course, we have to have uh, erosion sediment controls uh, that are very well done so that we're not uh, uh, you know, polluting with uh, brown water and whatnot into the bay and the marsh. The, the site is irregular, uh, making it somewhat challenging for development. Uh, of course, it needs um, water and sewer infrastructure uh, to uh, enable it to be developed as well. Okay, so one more thing that we had to take, pay attention to is the market. Um, we don't want to build something that no one wants to live there or something that's just going to be antiquated a few years down the road. You don't like to follow trends that are sort of just, you know, jazzy at the moment but go away in a couple of years. So we're looking really closely at what's going on in the market and the demographics of what's happening in housing. A lot of these things were already happening um, before COVID. COVID has just accelerated how people are thinking differently about where they live and how they want to live and in a lot of cases you know where they want to age what retirement looks like it's different these are all things i'll let you kind of peruse for yourself but um, these matter because whatever we do there nobody wins if there's no market for it and so that's something that we've been really um, paying attention to everything that's going on in that area and we think time is right right now to actually jump on this and it's going to continue for quite some time so i think we did that pretty fast but we really felt it was important to lay the context of sort of what has informed our overall development concept and this plus a lot of conversations and outreach and other things that we've been doing i've been in touch with rachel carter who is the daughter of judge carter and just trying to learn as much as we can so we're going to dive into the development concept now and ernie you're going to kick us off with that yeah, so how do we respond back on uh, slide nine? Rebecca pointed out uh, the key points that were expressed from the uh, conversations, the community conversations of access, preservation, agriculture, commercial, and housing. Um, go ahead. Overall, you can see the site uh, is uh, a significant area is uh, devoted to the farm. It's at least five acres plus that area uh, surrounding the Carter Historic Carter Farmhouse. Um, just in general, uh, what we've tried to do is keep all of our impervious surface more toward the center of the site, you know, away from the buffer zone. Uh, you see the homes are clustered so that, again, we're minimizing impervious surface through the site. Uh, we're providing uh, rain gardens as key amenities for uh, both uh, wildlife habitat and just the visual enjoyment because they will be populated with native species, uh, you know, flowering and, and uh, just a lot of greenery. Uh, we'll also have edible landscape, it's called, through the uh, development for the people, you know, the uh, residents to enjoy. This is berry bushes and fruit trees, things that are normally not part of a uh, development, but it's all with this idea of the agri-hood. You know, the, the notion is also that uh, site access uh, to the farm is going to be critical. Uh, we want to have workshops. We want the uh, farm to connect. We want it to sell, be a, a celebration place for local food, uh, for the community, and for the residents as well. 
So it's, it's you know, it's not just the residents' agrihood, it's the whole community's agrihood. Again, someplace, the, you know, we, we talked about local food, local jobs. Uh, we want to bring that back more and more and more. It is a growing trend, but we, we see that Centerville could be sort of a locus for this in the uh, eastern shore through this development. So, um, we can go to the next one. Trying to. <laughs> figure out what I'm doing here. Okay, I got it. All right. A again, uh, you know, part of this is creating and enhancing wildlife habitat, um, uh, using best practices on stormwater management, as we discussed, and also no-till agriculture to uh, eliminate any kind of uh, soil runoff into the uh, critical buffer zone area. Okay. So now we're going to dive into each of these five priorities. And um, not too deep, though, because we want to get through it all, and then um, we'll dive as deep as you want to go. This first one is uh, my graphic artist had a hard time figuring out what we were trying to portray here. But I think we, we tried to make an effort to really show three aspects of access um, that are happening with our proposed approach to the development of the site. And those include views, recreation, and connectivity. Views being basically the one that I think I heard the most of, which is don't mess with that view coming down Chesterfield Avenue where you see the farmhouse. And uh, I'm sorry, I have to tell this story because it was really funny, is when I talked to Rachel Carter, who's just a hoop, um, she's really fun. She, um, she was actually trying to be here tonight, but she got sick from her first COVID shot. But in any event, she said you could always tell when it was the day after 4th of July or the day after um, New Year's because of the tire tracks in our yard. <laughs> and so she mentioned that this was this place, her home, was such the life and heart and soul of the town. Um, and so I had some really good fun stories from her, but that notion that, yeah, that corner becomes a little too sharp uh, at certain times. And so that's another reason to protect that particular view corridor, not just because it's pretty. Uh, so views are important. And then the other two views that um, Ernie's going to talk a little bit about are these, these view corridors, because we're sitting up high, as we mentioned, with the steep slopes. Um, the ability to actually look out through the trees at some point toward the marsh, toward the river, are going to be very important aspects of views on this site. And then you've got recreation. What we're proposing is a fully ADA accessible trail through the site. This is not a gated community. It's fully accessible. Anybody will be able to walk through this site, see the farm, see what's happening, and be part of it. Um, but to ensure, as I like to say, you can shake, rock, and roll, but the, uh, the idea that anybody even in a wheelchair um, could come through this site or people who have physical disabilities, um, just as people with bicycles or walking or running could come through the site on this type of trail. Community gardening would happen as a set aside as part of the overall farm. And then overall connectivity, we're not really attached to MUDs. Infield sites typically have more next to them. There's not really much of a grid next to us, but the ability to connect at Chesterfield Avenue, of course, is happening with the main access road. And then we heard some of the feedback we received is that we did hear um, about the future potential connecting on the other side of the site if the school board were ever to change its plans. Um, you know, I, I don't, we just want to show that that's possible in our plan. And then Ernie's going to talk a little bit more um, specifically at two aspects that <clears throat> we know we've heard a lot about. So, yeah, we had a Zoom call uh, back with the staff in uh, January. And uh, actually, it was Mike Whitehill that suggested uh, when we were talking about the alternatives uh, for trail and uh, overlooks or you know, viewing. Uh, and so we came up with these two ideas of uh, overlooks. You can see the lower pictures show the buffer zone from the main body of the site. And it is very dense. Uh, now, it will be thinned somewhat when we remove the invasive species and whatnot and restore the buffer zone. Buffer zone. But uh, the concept here is that we have two overlooks, one uh, overlooking the marsh and one the Corsica River headwaters, and we build platforms with seating. These are then connected to the uh, main trail that uh, we would provide, and uh, this would be lit to this area. These would be publicly accessible um, to uh, you know, the general residents. So um, then the other- uh, I'm getting it, I'm getting it, there we go. <laughs> there you go. Discussion about, you know, we have the, the, this clustered housing. Uh, this is a fire access diagram that uh, was prepared 
uh, by our engineers. And what we're showing is that there will be roadways uh, capable of uh, supporting the loads of uh, fire trucks. Therefore, they can support loads of delivery vehicles or even cars for those uh, times when residents need to bring their cars to their homes. So uh, they would be well maintained. Uh, these would be privately constructed, privately maintained, uh, but they will be there to provide access uh, to each and every home. So yes, you can get a moving truck in there. Right. Absolutely. Um, going to the second priority uh, is, is around preservation. So basically we, we do historic preservation. Both of us have this in our background. I actually was once involved in leading the charge for a historic district designation. Um, so we want to see that happen. It's part of the roots, the value of the site. So the notion of preserving the Carter farmhouse is something that we didn't blink at. Of course, you would want to do that. We want to take it a step further. As I was digging into the heritage study um, and learning more about this corridor, the rail to wharf corridor, that's really exciting. We're on that corridor. And this sign, I actually went looking for it. It used to be on the school board property. I think with the rain garden, it may have gotten relocated. Um, but we want to be part of that rail corridor and um, the interpreted signage and things that sort of really enhance the importance of that and the roots of, of, um, of Centerville. And then the trees, it was interesting. One of our buyers, our prospective buyers, actually pointed out um, how important those heritage trees are on that site. And they're, they're phenomenal. They're beautiful. They are really part of that whole thing. It's not just about the house that we want to absolutely um, preserve also to the extent that they're healthy and able. In terms of the farmhouse itself, to really take a moment on that, because it is so important, particularly, and, and these, I want to point out these handwritten notes. These were things that Rachel shared with me from her dad writing because um, there's some you can see it in front of you better than on the screen but to really think about um, you know the history of this house starting back in 1908 so Ernie you want to mention your work in this area well you know I've uh, restored literally scores of uh, historically significant structures uh, those listed on the National Register everything from small houses up to a train station and uh, this building has its challenges you know the uh, foundation is very old, uh, the structure uh, has issues, but we are absolutely committed to restoring the shell of this building and preserving it, and then trying to find the best possible uh, use, whether it be a residence or a farm to table restaurant or a and b to market it, to, uh, to bring it back to life and uh, continue to be an important part of the community. So priority number three, agriculture. Um, of course, we're about agriculture. We want to do an agri-hood. Uh, but the thing about agri-hoods, and there's so many examples to share at the end, is that um, they're about building community. Um, having agriculture and food in the middle of, an, of a neighborhood like this is a way of bringing people together. And existing residents um, and new residents coming together, you know, training programs, farm programs, things that actually make this the center of what's happening. And so there's a lot of ways we can do that. We've, in our research, it's seen that really anything less than five acres will make it very difficult for this farm to be economically viable. And so we've been trying to hang on to that five acres and do other things that will help to keep it viable as a working economically supported farm through CSA. And then of course, still reserving some of those community garden areas on the farm. The fourth area is around commercial. We do have incorporated into our plan a commercial segment. Uh, I think that's always been envisioned um, as part of the TND and, and previous thoughts. We really see this and what our focus will be is try to market this as this food-centered retail option. Um, and that we would do that in collaboration and in coordination to complement what's already going on in Main Street. I actually ran a Main Street program in my, in my past when I was a community development director. Uh, I've been a consultant to the National, National Main Street Center. I'm really looking forward to this component because I think it's something that, um, as I was looking at your um, market analysis that was done a few years back, realizing that the capture rate hopefully has improved, but it's, it's not good. That's my one typo in your printout, by the way. It's actually seven and a half cents on a dollar of a capture rate. And so hopefully that's improved. 
I think we can help with that. I think this is going to be something that can help really create more money coming into the local economy and staying here in the local economy through how we become part of that overall strategy. And just following up on that, um, these agri-hood type developments have received very significant positive press uh, throughout the country where they've uh, happened. So we would expect that to occur here and bring, you know, I think, uh, attention to this development and to Centerville. Um, in terms of the other priority, housing, uh, the housing will be a, a diverse uh, type of housing, everything from uh, single story uh, to double story, ranging in size from, say, uh, you know, 1,300 square feet up to 2,200 square feet. Um, the, the homes will also be certified as net zero ready through the DOE program. This means that if you put solar on your roof, it'll generate as much power as the home consumes in a year. Uh, I've done this before. It will work here. Uh, it requires that the homes be built fairly airtightly, which is not a bad thing if you have uh, a way of delivering fresh air on a continuous basis, which we can do through what's called an energy recovery ventilator. It's like having your windows open, but not paying the energy bill. So you're getting fresh air on a continuous basis, but it's uh, energy is recaptured. So we talked, you know, earlier I said it's always good to talk. Uh, we've been talking with our focus group uh, for over a year and a half. Um, and, um, you know, we have a group of 15 interested uh, families that are interested in the site. So will this work? We think it will because we have people uh, literally ready to sign up uh, and we have not yet advertised or marketed it whatsoever. So uh, it's, you know, it's a lifestyle that people are interested in. Uh, it's about a lot of things that, uh, you know, it's about sus sustainability, but also resiliency. Uh, you know, can you, do you have access to local food? You know, in these times of disruption, it's sure nice to have local food around, you know, so. so I just want to mention, this is where we started, it was around my kitchen table um, two years ago with our prospective homeowners. That's how we like to work. COVID has made this so difficult, but normally I'd be knocking on doors and having meetings and talking to people and just kind of listening and learning. Um, so we once again do appreciate being able to be here. It's the best I know we all can do right now, um, but that's the fun way to do it, I think, um, starting around the table. So, okay, we're getting there, we're almost there. Um, the so, site plan, you have a big copy in front of you. We're gonna just touch on a few things you just heard about and then finish up with some of the slides. If you can see the pointer on the screen there, this is phase one, which is 25 homes where our buyers are uh, interested in signing up for. Uh, the phase 1A would be constructed at the same time. Then with the absorption of this, we would move on to phase two and phase three. Um, the stats are on your printout in terms of the number of homes and whatnot. Uh, we were paying attention to this notion of trying to create a long Chesterfield here. We have this concept of a live work. Down. Oh, sorry. Yep. Here, let me uh, do it. I got it. You got it? I got, I got it. it. On the far left. I know. It's really tricky. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Right uh, it's here. It's a live work uh, building far that would you know, be uh, made to look residential in appearance, as would the other commercial buildings. And of course, the other single family that we're showing uh, to the far right uh, along Chesterfield. And that's intended to actually create kind of more of a continuation of that single family that right. is on Chesterfield right now. Right. So we're gonna go back to this and you've got the full one in front of you, but we wanted to just kind of bring it all together with the actual visual and move into this last segment. Public yeah, so, you know, in addition to those key things, what else uh, is being brought to the table here? In terms of uh, public-private partnership, uh, we are showing that on the slide that it generates about uh, 300,000 a year in income and property taxes, about 1.8 million in uh, capacity fees, and about 1.2 million in county impact fees. And in addition to that, uh, we think that uh, yeah, I, I get caught up doing economic and market analysis quite a bit in my work. And um, the, the hard numbers, the, the, the direct impact is a little easier to run a number on. The one that people often forget about is the indirect, which is the multiplier effect. You know, how much can we really stimulate the local economy um, through new local spending 
And the fact that this is a walkable neighborhood, this isn't a neighborhood where people are gonna necessarily get in their car to go to everything. They can actually, if from this neighborhood, walk and spend money in town and do things in town and not go to the next town or somewhere else to do that. So that indirect multiplier effect, I didn't run numbers to try to specifically quantify that, but even at a 10% capture rate, you might be talking at at least 350,000 more per year with this number of residents. Um, you know, staying in the local economy, even with that small amount of capture rate, not to mention all the other types of spending that, that would potentially occur. So as we um, also mentioned, um, you know, the, the next steps are, of course, going through the entitlement approvals. Um, this site, of course, did not progress under the TND. It was found uh, economically not viable. Um, there's a quote here from Joe Downey, one of the owners along uh, with Barry Olaf, uh, about their history in terms of other developers who have approached them wanting to do at least 200 or so units on the site. Uh, how are we going to make it work? Well, uh, because we're looking at this, again, with this sort of uh, more condensed view of the homes, less paving, less infrastructure costs, uh, the performer works. Uh, and again, we Barely. have interested buyers. <laughs> it does work, <laughs> but, it's, yeah. but it's, not, it's not easy, you know, doing this type of development, particularly in a critical area um, where we have to be even more sensitive to what's going on and the, least, the less amount of developable area on a site. Yeah, we uh, uh, had, a, I had a brief conversation uh, with critical area commission staff just to find out what's the history of approvals and uh, we did find out, of course, it was approved, uh, but uh, for the public access uh, plan, which had apparently never been submitted, as far as they knew, uh, to finalize that. Now, maybe the uh, staff member had that wrong, but, you know, that's what this they... This is the CAC yeah. person, yeah. Yeah, that's what right. they told me, so. Um, so, basically, we have all of this, but then we do have these assumptions and realities to make this project work, and a lot of it is around, you know, striking while this iron is hot on the market. And Ernie, you want to go through some of that? Yeah, of course, uh, we have the entitlement approvals. Uh, if we, uh, you know, financing, we're having conversations with uh, 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 lending institutions at this time. Uh, again, given the uh, pre-sales that we can achieve, uh, we feel confident that'll happen. Um, and again, this notion of preserving the farmhouse, uh, you know, other homes could be located on the farmhouse site and on the farm site. But again, we think that's just too much uh, overall units, uh, too much density for the uh, neighborhood. And I think it uh, compares favorably in terms of number of units, what was previously approved. So the uh, in terms of, yeah, uh, next steps, I guess uh, we are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, this is, there's a lot of next steps here. Uh, it's a very complicated process, but uh, with, you know, uh, Barry Griffith and Ryan Showalter, uh, we feel we'll have uh, good pilots to take us through it. So, um, go ahead, Rebecca. It, 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 it's complex. Um, I just came off running a major real estate development. Ernie's done it his whole life. Um, there's so many critical paths and things that connect on these things that um, we're paying attention to all of that also. So in just closing, um, basically we've provided for you a little bit of information about who else is doing this. Um, we wanted to kind of just give that to you for your own perusal. One of the things I will, I will kind of invite you to do, I won't do it now because I know we're out of time, but there's this great YouTube five minute video that Urban Land Institute is on this link. Uh, it's really worth watching um, and, and just kind of getting a feel for what's going on in the market as it relates to agri-hoods. They actually track all of those around the country. I'm sure they don't have all of them on here. I know they don't. We hope to be added to that dot on their map and, um, you know, get a lot of, uh, of attention to Centerville, the right kind of attention. Willisford is, is one that people talk about a lot. It's in Virginia. I put the website in here so you can all look, you know, if you're interested further. Um, Prairie Hill is one that Ernie has personally visited also. Um, yeah, and say about that. one of our key advisors uh, was involved in this project. He's a 
PhD in agronomy from the very beginning, so he has uh, sort of a lot of the development uh, history as well, which is very useful. Um, third one, and there's many, I could go on and on, just wanted to give you a flavor of this, this one, just to show that commercial is typically part of these, some level, some small scale food, just really that value product, you know, added value products coming right from the farm, uh, being part of, of essentially what's being offered. So that's it. We're looking forward to spending some time. Hopefully you have some time left. We did not hit 20 minutes. I apologize. Um, but we did our best to give you the big, the big picture and to let you know a little bit of who we are. This is us. This is us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we believe in the work we do and we really want to work with you in Centerville um, to, make, to make this happen. Um, yeah, again, uh, thank you for allowing us to present. We truly want this to be part of Centerville. We want it to be your agrihood, your part of your neighborhood. It's very important to us. Uh, we realize, uh, you know, we've tried to tell you what we heard and how we're responding uh, regarding site access. You know, we have a different vision on the trail. We want you to like look at the big, uh, the whole totality of what we're trying to do here in the context of, uh, you know, suggesting that we uh, go forward. The next step for us would be to submit uh, text amendments under the PUD. We agree that the TND text amendments are not appropriate, but the PUD would be, we believe. And uh, we'd like to uh, you know, start going through the stack review process or whatever town manager thinks is appropriate as next steps if we can do that. We'd very much appreciate that. So let's talk. Where do you want to dive in? We can go back to, I can try to move back to whatever slide. Do we have time for questions? Or? It's up to you. It's totally your, up to your you. Comments. I mean, it was great. Uh, you know, why don't we go around and maybe if council members have comments or questions, uh, we can certainly do that knowing that we want to kind of keep time, sure. uh, time here. Shelby, do you have anything you want to add or is there anybody that wants to jump out and say anything? Okay. Sure. So, uh, you know, my day job is conservation and water quality and wildlife habitat. So I, Appreciate the heck out of this concept. I think if you want different outcomes, you have to have different outputs. So I appreciate the vision of this and uh, I appreciate sort of walking through how the trail and the access roads would work. Uh, just my question is kind of a little parochial. Um, you're gonna restore the buffer area and I, uh, from the frag down on the shoreline up on into the trees, I'm sure it's covered up in invasive species, but what's the, Long term, you know, that requires a fair amount of active management. Once you address it, if you just walk away from it, right, it's going to be a mess again pretty quickly. So what, uh, and this goes really for all this stuff, the, the, the trail and the, not the trail, but the mm -hmm. pathways and other things. What's the long term upkeep look like in the terms of the community here? Well, the HOA that would be established, there would be a master HOA for the entire site. And then there would be individual HOAs for each of the phases. And the master HOA uh, would uh, take care of the buffer zone and maintain it uh, on a regular basis. We've uh, had some estimates of what that would cost from some buffer, buffer zone management people. And we're building that into the projected HOA fees. Thank you. Anything you want to add? So phase one to 25 homes. This home all the way in the back, one of these houses in the back, accessibility. So if you have a fire in one of these houses, you're saying this path will support a fire truck? Yes, sir. A 90,000 pound fire truck? Yes, sir. How, all right, we'll have to dive into how, how that path's going to be, because I can tell you, it doesn't look like it's going to support a fire truck to me, but we can look at it. And what are the, do you have a price range of the homes? Uh, we're starting in, uh, in the high 300s and uh, going up from there, okay. depending on the square footage and, mm -hmm. you know, with or right. without basements, because we'll be right. offering uh, full basements as a uh, option. Okay. Bob, you got anything? Uh, this, I love the idea of um, the conservation of our waterfront. And I know with Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, and I know up in Kent County, my grandkids go to uh, uh, ex-Congressman Gilchrist's uh, mm -hmm. environmental, uh, and it's, it's a place where children go every year. And I know right here in Centerville, we have two elementary schools. We have a middle school, we have the high school. 
uh, I would assume that, I'm going to say assume, uh, that the HOA would be cognizant of uh, possibly this becoming part of the educational experience for our town, for our children. Uh, the Board of Education is right down the street now, but I know they would be, I, I know a number of the supervisors, I, they would be very interested in incorporating this into the curriculum of, we're a farm-based community. And for our children to both be exposed to the water and the farm in the future would be, I think, very beneficial to our culture and our values. So glad to hear you say that. Um, we're so excited about those kinds of possibilities. I've actually started to have conversations with Future Harvest and with uh, um, our BIDCO and others to really look at how we could create kind of a, a training and education element to the farm. Um, so when we start searching for a farm operator manager, it would be with some of those kind of conditions in mind that this would be a place where those other, those other types of activities could actually happen and be integrated. And there is a track in the high school for agriculture. I didn't know that. Okay, yes. add that to I, my I list. I substituted okay. there. <laughs> okay. So there is, and it would be a welcome addition, and we have a couple of environmental uh, teachers there also. Yes. So this would be, uh, <clears throat> you got my... We would really, that would make this even more special in our mind, is it's a way to bring the community in, into this place and, and get even better better out activity. and you know this has been done before at prairie crossing uh, michael sands our consultant who was involved in prairie crossing they actually have training farms on site um, half acre up to two to three acres uh, to train farmers and also they are very connected with school programs and so we're taking that knowledge that experience and and you know we'll be able to dovetail it right into this development would this be like micro farms to teach young people how to be maybe do organic farming? I'm, I'm, no, I, I think out of the box. I so. want to. We. I am so looking forward to getting to that place where we can start programming what happens at the farm. I. I I've started actually. I'm charged with a lot of the startup aspect of the farm, and so I started really doing a, a lot of that research and talking to people, and that would be so exciting, I mean, to be able to do those kinds of things. So we'll be talking, I hope. Yeah, we, 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 we talk about a good, better, best scenario for the farm. Everything from we just lease it to the farmer, uh, to doing the education, to actually even creating value-added food products. You know, so the Carter Farm grape jelly or something or whatever, you know, those kinds of things. And again, this has been done before. Uh, and and we, are at, we have access to that experience and knowledge as part of our team. But so. it'll be more special here. <laughs> <laughs> Shelby, do you have anything you want to add? Yes. Um, so I just want to say this is a wonderful presentation and a very exciting concept. So thank you guys for coming. Um, one question that I just had looking at the plan, um, how many parking spots are there per home? Two. Okay, so each home has two right. parking Plus spots. Plus guest parking, right. But they're not in front of the home, so everyone has to walk then to their Right. Residents, okay. And you can ask one of our prospective buyers here how she <laughs> how she thinks about that. <laughs> but I know it's different. Um, yeah, it's it is. And but when I think about it, I I live in a walkable place right now where I literally don't get in my car for two weeks at a time because I walk to everything. I know I'm unusual, um, <laughs> but um, this is happening where the car is less of the focus and it's more about bumping into your neighbor as you kind of take that little one block i mean we're talking yeah so that that's it's not i was gonna say what's the farthest distance then from your parking to your the farthest residence. well you know if you think in terms of time i've actually calculated it uh <laughs> and it's somewhere between 40 <laughs> seconds and two minutes to the furthest house okay so yeah. and you you know you just get to walk more past more neighbors homes so, okay you know. yeah no it's 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 different but it's happening in a lot of places and it's actually making places more friendly in neighborhood oh yeah versus driving into your garage shutting the door and you know shutting yourself away right and none of these houses homes have garages but there are sheds i think i saw there'll be uh, uh parking carports at, at the parking area one okay one per spot and they'll have a storage area within those so, Little sheds. People yeah. have stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can hang their kayaks there yeah. and whatnot. So if you, uh, sorry, if you uh, came home from the store with some groceries or you had a maybe a child in a car carrier, 
um, how you know would you you could still drive to your home yes yes, yes absolutely okay. and and I know we have to convince Jeff but um, our other engineers have We've, we've done these things before in terms of the fire access lanes, and, and we will absolutely make sure that they accommodate. Well, the fire marshal will certainly make yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, so the idea is to do it in a way where you've got that load bearing, but at the same time, you have um, sort of this pleasant environment to go by that. And so the idea of moving trucks, fire trucks, emergency vehicles, you know, um, delivery trucks, any of those types of things, being able to go through those lanes, which look small on that map, but this is a lot of property. When you blow it up to scale, well, typically it's there's big. also uh, golf carts that are for community use to transport materials. Not one per household. No, not one per household. Have to share. But <laughs> you know, and, and you know, it's it's not beyond belief that someday you'll be able to take that and then it will drive itself Make back itself and park back. itself, right? So I. Believe it or not, I was it's dealing coming. with a lot of so. automated stuff when my other work in Pittsburgh. Do you have anything else? Are the access streets uh, just one way? Are they two-way streets? Uh, they'd be one way, essentially, okay. yeah. But they'd be wide enough if two vehicles had to pass each or other. Or you could pull over. Yeah, right. right. So you could definitely pull over yeah. and someone could come by. Okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's and then the turnaround, one of the things we did, um, Steve and, and, and some of you that saw the earlier version, is that there were a couple of houses down here. Yeah, we, we, in, in response to some of what we, we've heard, um, we moved those actually um, down and actually opened up that space to allow for adequate turnaround for emergency vehicles or anything down at that point right. also. So we're also planning for the ability to come in, be able to do a good old three-point turn that we all learned one day, um, or be able to have that larger vehicle type turnaround down at the end also. So I just have a couple of comments, right? I, I appreciate you guys coming here and showing us this concept. Um, as as I was quoted in the uh, in the uh, <laughs> the thing, you know, I do I believe that this is this is probably one of the most important pieces of property development properties in town, if not the most important. And and I appreciate that it's not just a cookie cutter going in here, right? I mean, I've spent a lot of time with the planning commission uh, over the past decade coming up with the TND zone and and I fully believe that you know the easiest path is not necessarily the right path and I think that you have the opportunity to build something special here I love the fact that there's going to be commercial I like the idea of possibly having studios and then apartment or you know housing up on top of that I think all of this stuff is 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 a great concept the devil is in the details right I think that if you can convince the fire marshal that it's okay and you can convince uh, you know, a, a mom with two screaming kids and a bag full, you know, a, a thing full of groceries in the middle of the rain, that, that they're gonna, that that's okay. But the people that don't want that, they're not gonna live there, right? So it's not like you're going in and one day all of a sudden you don't have access. So they're gonna know that. Um, farmhouse preservation is so important, right? I mean, if you guys have been down here in the past couple of weeks, this is the peak of, the, of that big giant tulip tree. I mean, it's just I have a fantastic. Picture of it. Sandy sent um, me a picture of it. It's the Agra Hood, I think, is great. Um, I like the creative out of box thinking. My biggest problem is the trail. So I, I look today, this is, uh, this is one of the copies of the 1998 comp plan. 1998 comp plan has that in here, has it around the perimeter. And so that's almost 25 years old, right? And so one of the quotes that you have on here is, is Ed McMahon. I'm a big fan of Ed. I think he's, he's a, a visionary, right? Vision counts and implementation is priceless. I, for me, you've got to have that trail. I mean, that's just, I just know that, that with the trails that you guys have proposed, people are not going to venture in. But if there is a perimeter trail going around, uh, I, I think it, it, makes, it makes all of the difference. I think that the Planning Commission is really going to want to see that. And I do believe the Critical Area Commission is going to want to see that as well. So other than that, I, I think I'd love to see you figure out how to make it work. The trail, uh, I don't know, uh, from your description of the topography of the, of the property, uh, it's not an easy thing in the slope of the property from the river's edge up. It's like 25 feet, if I saw it correct. Here's the well, section that... There, there's um, a, there was yeah. a trail that we yeah. had put in before. Well, so it, I, I would love to look at that. Uh, can I, uh, one thing, the Carter house is that little house on the circle there, right? Um, yes, right at the end of the circle, right here. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I, it's not labeled, but I just want to... Oh, it's not? I missed that. Okay. Well, yeah. That's okay. I missed it. I figured it. I saw the big tree. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, well, we appreciate you guys coming. Thank you, and... Uh,
<laughs> yeah, but we'll, we'll be back in touch, right? So what's the next step? Here from Me, Steve. I got to see a trail. I mean, I, I'm just telling you, I know the Planning Commission, and I know they're going to be they're going to be pushing that as well. So I would I would like to see I'd like to see a perimeter trail. I mean, I, I just think that's so critical. And how can we um, further, I guess, um, share our study of the engineering of the issues with that? You can share it with Steve. I mean, the perimeter trail is not a consensus priority, though. Just to be clear. I do believe that at a previous meeting we did discuss how that it's important, and, and if and if we want to take a vote and say how important that is, I'm totally fine. I'm just telling you that this property, this viewscape, to me, is so critical to have a perimeter yeah, our, trail. Our our concerns are with uh, an eight foot wide trail uh, through the buffer zone is that you wind up with something almost 24 feet wide by the time you deal with the cross slope issues, ADA access, and all those things. So. Those are some of the complications that uh, we'd like to discuss, you know, further uh, with uh, if this is with uh, Steve Ooh, and the staff. Then there's yeah. the. I mean, I think you're welcome to have those conversations. Yeah, with them. because you know that's the challenges that we just can't get our heads around right now. And uh, there, uh, I have a question: the maintenance of it. I mean, I look at Millstream uh, Trail. Uh, are we, as the town, going to assume the maintenance of that trail? I think those are all decisions that are TBD. Yeah. You know, we're, no, no. you saw that, that concept, right? All those yeah. things that were up there, yeah. that's like, you know, yeah, question right, number right. Six, yeah. 642. So right. those are all things I think TBD. Yeah. Okay. Well, well we'd like you. to start thank construction you by very next much. year. So we hope we can <laughs> figure out how to do that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks, thanks, thanks Shelby. Thank time. you. So, um, appreciate you're going to do this? Okay. Great. Um, we do have a couple of extra copies. Were there enough, Carolyn, for everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Chris Jakubiak, Town Planner, Municipal Growth Element. Hi, Chris. to see you again. <laughs> well, um, the um, Planning Commission is, as you probably know, uh, gradually updating the current comprehensive plan. And one other item of that is the municipal growth element. And it's a requirement of state law that uh, municipal growth be addressed in the plan as its own chapter, its own element. And um, the probably the most important part of the municipal growth element is to see how much room we have in the town for new housing development. And to match that up with the capacity in our water and sewer facilities, but also schools and police and fire, but mostly water and sewer, uh, that's the most important thing. And this comes out of uh, many years of um, work with the Maryland Department of Environment and other state agencies with municipalities all over Maryland, from Western uh, Maryland to the Lower Eastern Shore, um, trying to make sure that we're planning ahead and we're accommodating uh, the needs for water and sewer facilities. So what I have here today is, uh, well, what you have is the municipal growth element as a draft that uh, we discussed at the last Planning Commission meeting in March. And um, I, I don't necessarily want to take it, you through every page. Um, and I know you just received this today. It just occurred to me that you might not have it, so I contacted Carolyn. Um, but let me just summarize some points. And uh, Sharon is here, too, uh, to talk about um, APFO and if, if issues about you know, what if someone submits a development plan, you find you don't have the capacity to serve that development plan, questions like that. Um, um, let's turn to page two, uh, please. Uh, you'll see that the title is Zoned Development Capacity. So what we did was look at the uh, entire town and see, and by zoning district, 
and to see roughly what the available acreage was for new household development, new housing units. Um, and uh, we total those up. And the current estimate is, is there in that chart below where you see the sum. Total available acreage, 279 acres. Potential housing units, uh, 1,177. Let's call it 1,200. Um, that is the capacity. That's the potential for development within the town's boundaries now. And it includes a project like the Carter Farm. Um, if you turn to the next page, you'll see a map. Uh, and if you look closely, you'll see there's five shaded uh, areas, five yellow areas. Um, these are major tracts of land. Um, and they can accommodate, under the current zoning, quite a bit of development. Uh, so it's those five really are the bulk of that 1,200 units. Um, the current draft of the engineer's study examining the wastewater treatment plant and what it would be ta take to expand it um, shows that the current capacity of the plant is 542,000 gallons per day. Um, and the current use is about 400,000 gallons per day. So we have an available capacity of 142. That's the excess capacity, 142,000 gallons to distribute or to allocate. And if you divide that by 250, which is generally the value of or the, what a single family house would typically use, you'd end up with 568 equivalent dwelling units. So the way to look at the current capacity in the town's wastewater system is to say, well, we have a capacity to serve an additional 568 dwelling units. And that's just the, the kind of theoretical capacity based on what the engineers are saying, the plan is sized at. Five I'm saying right now, yes. We can. We have 578 EDUs to allocate. 568. Yeah. In an ideal world where there's yes. no I and I and it, lots of rain right. and that's based on the capacity of uh, and the current mm -hmm. use. That that's the rated capacity, the capa capacity that's approved by MDE. It doesn't mean that um, there's. I mean, the system has to work ideally. That's right. But I just want to, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the precision here. Um, what I want to do is compare that 568 against what I just read to you, the 1,200. There's a capa there's an ability, a potential for 1,200 units, uh, and we have less than 600 allocations to distribute. And we're not calling this, we're not, I haven't said anything about commercial or industrial or YMCA. You know, so um, this is conversation is just meant to point out that it's time to begin planning for the future. Um, it's not as if all of those 1,200 are going to come online tomorrow um, or next year or, frankly, within the next 20 years. Um, and on that point, I'd like to turn your attention to page um, four here. There's a chart here that shows alternative projections of household growth, and there are four projections that we looked at. Without going through all of them, we, we kind of think that the town is headed somewhere between projection number two and three. And if you look at that chart and go over to the right-hand side, you'll see the change between 2020 and 2040. Percent change um, for projection two would be 38%, uh, which means you add 714 units. And what that means is that if the town grows the way it has grown over the past 10 years, that same rate of growth is projected between 20 and 20, 2020 and 2040, we'll add about 714 units. Okay, so you know, I pointed out that we have 12, a capacity for room for 1,200, potential for 1,200, but realistically, if we continue to grow the way we have, maybe we have 715 or so. 
or maybe a bit more. I mean, if the, the county continues to become a bigger share of the county, and it is, and that's the county's plan for us, without a doubt, where municipalities should be the location for development, it's conceivable that maybe on the upper end of things, we add 1,500 units. Um, if water and sewer were not an issue, there's plenty of land for that within the town already without any zoning changes necessary on any given Wednesday night someone could show up to the Planning Commission with a proposal uh, for development because uh, there's room for it and the zoning exists for it so just to kind of wrap this up there there is a demand that's latent in our current development pattern there's a lot of empty space that can be filled up Developers have the right to come in and petition for your approval, planning commission approval. Um, we don't have the capacity in our treatment plant or system to serve that potential. Generally, you should. Or at least you should have a pathway to get there. If you don't have a pathway to get there and you don't want to get there, then we look at the land use plan and say, well, maybe we need to think about changing our land use potential, bring that potential in balance with our policy about facilities. And that's a really important um, decision, policy that rests with your board and, and then would be implemented by the planning commission and staff. Um, the question is, does the, uh, do the commissioners want to, your body, does, does your, this body want to move forward with expanding the wastewater treatment plant? Um, and the reason that the Planning Commission thought it was important that I come tonight is that the whole plan hinges on that question, the comprehensive plan, because if you, as a matter of policy, say, well, I don't think that's the future for us. We don't want to have to go out and buy another tract of land for spray irrigation, and we don't want to have to come up with, say, 10 to $20 million to fund a new wastewater treatment plant, and we don't want to grow. We want to stay where we are then the Planning Commission needs to know that. We're going to have a completely different land use plan. It'll be much different than the plan you have now. Okay, And so we want the, the plan to be in balance with your vision for public facilities with infrastructure. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if you have any questions um, or discussion, I can. As you probably know, we are in the process of the preliminary uh, engineering report, right? So that I, read that I think is an important one for us to get. Right. Um, we've been going through our budget process, and one of the things that uh, we have budgeted for in our enterprise capital budget is a new farm. So I think that's a, a start, right? The, we haven't talked about putting that farm into production, nor uh, putting in a, an upgrade to the wastewater treatment facility. But I do believe that a new farm will help go a long way towards the potential of a future expansion, right? So I think, I think if, so I, I, I'm hopeful to hear from other council members, but I think, st you know, metered growth over the next 20 years is something that I think we should definitely consider. And I certainly would like to hear from Sharon about uh, property rights and capacity and, and how that would affect some of the decisions that we're making. So I'm, I'm happy to hear from any other council members about you know, what their thoughts are. I don't necessarily have any thoughts about the municipal growth element, although I will say you know, sort of one of, the, one of my foundational principles is not to get caught into a situation where we cannot say no to growth because we are in such a dire financial strait with potentially, to your point, $20 million in debt to expand, you know, we already have 16, to expand the wastewater treatment facility, and you get into a situation where we've seen with some other Eastern Shore municipalities where they lose the ability to say no and really have, you know, to, to entertain proposals like this, for instance, the Carter Farm, because they just need as many allocations as possible, or they need to sell as many allocations, get as many ratepayers as possible. So I think my, my motivating force is ensuring that the growth is metered, that there is some control retained, and that the public, you know, when, you, when, you, when you go out and talk to the public, and we all just got elected not that long ago, nobody is clamoring for more of anything. You, 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 you don't talk to anyone who says, we want another neighborhood. 
I mean, at least I didn't, I didn't talk to everybody. And so, you know, I, I just, that's in the back of my mind that there's just not a ton of public demand for out of control growth, certainly, but even fast growth, yeah, even strong growth, I think there would be uh, some questions. So just that's opinionating more than. I'm in 100% agreement questions. about the, you know, getting caught in a position where you don't have control, right? right? Uh, so I, I think that's super important. Uh, Chris, yeah. I have, look, we talk about water treatment and water, water and sewer plant. Um, uh, Steve and yourself were talking 10, 20, whatever million dollars for a new plant, new capacity to uh, accommodate the growth. Uh, is the town going to have to go into debt or we just talked earlier that there are grants, you know, that are of, uh, for rural communities uh, to build? And uh, uh, I am not fully aware, uh, but I, I'm just going to ask, do we have to go into, quote unquote, debt to b expand our water treatment or, or, or is there access to other avenues of funding? There's access to other avenues of funding, but I can't answer whether you'll need to go into debt or not. I'm not the right person for that. Okay. I, I just don't know. All right. I really don't my know. Ne my next question, uh, we've already been approached by a developer outside of the dotted blue line for a development, which I think, um, since the county has already said that, um, the growth will be uh, by the towns and not by just placing uh, communities scattered around the county. That's the state, by the way. Oh, okay, the state and then the county is instituting it. That uh, I think from an economic development standpoint, that developer is outside the blue line. I think in talking with them already, myself personally, I don't know if any of my other council members have a you know talk with him, uh, but his plan I think is very economically feasible. It would add to the town and the county, and uh, I'm just saying. And then looking at the 2015 plan that is on our website, that is um, looks forward and which I assume you're building on. There, I look at it. There are three corridors of future development out 213 past symphony village to 301 there's the obvious one from the acme shopping center lions then past the high school and that whole thing is you know it's already here and then you got the uh, other one from the united methodist church out to 301. Um, i i've only lived in the county 30 years uh, one of the other candidates that didn't uh, win uh, Fred McNeil has been here 40, and he made a statement, and I think it's pretty true, the town doubled in 40 years. And while maybe there is, we're not going to build a Walmart in the county, but I think the population will grow and double in the next 40 years. There are people, just the presentation we had tonight of what the future of uh, jobs will be uh, is very, people will come to Queen Anne's County, they will come to the town of Centerville because of the quality of life. And so I'm, I might not live to see it, but I think and I believe if we don't, if we, we say, oh, the current population says no growth, uh, uh, no. There's going to be growth. And if we, we put our head in the sand and, well, people don't want growth, no, it's going to happen. And we have to be uh, forthright. We have to look to the future and, uh, and plan for it. And I thank you. Shelby, do you have anything you want to add? Questions or anything? Um, no questions. I would just say that, you know, I understand that growth is necessary, but I definitely am for, you know, thoughtful, 
slow growth. I think that retaining the quality of our town and how quaint and charming it is is really important. So I just want to make sure that, you know, it's very thoughtful growth. Jeff, do you have anything? I'm with everybody else. Smart, smart right, so, growth. So I, I would just say that I appreciate you coming. Right? I remember having this conversation on the Planning Commission, and I remember specifically saying we need to get the council's input on how it's going to go, right? I think that with us putting in the budget, number one, paying for the, the engineering review, and even though it's only a plan, right, and also committing to putting in the budget money for a, uh, a farm, I think that we are looking at some metered growth, right? One of the other things I just wanted to add to, to Bob's point in terms of, of grants, anybody that does come in has to bring their own capacity, right? It doesn't mean they need to bring their own farm, but they need to pay their share. Oh, so yeah. in addition to paying for allocations, they need to pay for their share of expanding the treatment plant. You mean annexation property? Annexation, yep, coming in from outside of town, yep. Annexation uh, from outside of town. I do also think that we really need to, to make sure that we've got enough for the existing properties, not to necessarily fully develop, right? Because if you look at the Carter farm, they could go much more intense, but the reality is they're probably not going to do that. Same thing with the uh, Turpins farm, right? They, they're probably not going to go as, as, as intense. So I, I, I believe that you should probably go back to the Planning Commission and say, let's, let's look at a metered approach, right? And, and we don't need to put in a, a treatment facility now, but let's see what the engineering uh, plan says. Right, because you can't necessarily put in a just a, a small little treatment. They, they sort of come in blocks. You uh -huh. know, you know, so. I do also think that you know, as we hit that 80 percent with the engineering study, with the commitment to potentially buying a farm, it's going to help us to you know, as we get closer, we don't necessarily have to be as nervous. This, uh, and, this oh, sorry. helps because it uh, makes it clear that I could go back to the planning commission and say that um, the, the town has had a growth plan. We're not necessarily departing from it, but I, I, we have to be intentional about what we're doing. Like what I heard tonight was a discussion of the possible benefits to the community of a project. And that's kind of a nice thing when someone actually comes to a, you with a proposal that presumably could benefit you. So there's an intention. And so each one of these major parcels ought to be focused, thought about in an intentional way. This is our intention. If you can meet these standards, which means that the plan does get written a different way. Because right now, it's just, it's, it's open season. So we can, we can write the right regs to communicate what your intention is um, and what level of density would be allowed provided certain standards were met, performance standards would be like. So I think we have flexibility. And, and meanwhile, the Council could start planning for that incremental increase in your capacity. And Council Member Hardy mentioned uh, 213 out to 301 and 304 out to 301 and 305 out to 301. I couldn't be any more opposed to the spider like growth of Centerville out to 301. Like a long corridor. And, or and, and I just think that is exactly the way to get to the opposite of what Shelby is talking about, which is just a you know you're you're that's the that that is the death of downtown and i i think if you look at I me mean, i see this carter farm proposal and as i said to the rebecca and ernie you know if you want different outcomes you need different inputs and i think the growth plan needs to reflect the fact that we what people say when they don't want growth is that they don't want the stuff that looks like what's here now right they don't want more of this old style strip mall and and that sort of thing and and the, the cookie cutter grid like neighborhoods that's what people are i think are rebelling against and i just this notion of lighting up 213 out to 301 uh, or 304 305 Frewsburg road hope road uh well i hope we're a long way from doing that uh, have you looked though at the plans there is major elements of commercial development uh, on out past the high school on the well, right hand yeah. side. The, the I'm just saying. So the it isn't just the cookie cutter development. And, and I totally agree with you. And I think the operative word is Fred McNeil coined it one night smart development. And Nobody I, wants I, dumb development. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's. it's <laughs> well, I, like, it's, I like to think about it as, as development in terms of the town's development, not in the sense that the town's 
the development is just houses or buildings, but the town itself develops as a community. You develop like yes. anything that's good develops. That's what a plan ought to be. And so that's what I'd like to take back to them. Okay, I, I, think, I think you absolutely should. Sharon, is there anything you want to add? I, I, my eyes are opened a little bit. I didn't realize where the, the plant is right now in terms of capacity. I will say, I think over the past several months, we've had more activity in terms of developments than we've had in many years combined. The business park, there's a lot going on there, the YMCA, you know, now you have the Carter Farm, Turpin Farm, you could very quickly be out of capacity. Yeah. But um, I, I mean, I functionally think we are. Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. now we are. So I, one of the things I yeah. think are very important in addition to, you know, you're doing the preliminary engineering report, but also to update the capacity management plan and the sewer allocation policy for the capacity you do have, how do you want to allocate it and what's the plan for that? Um, just to get that. And, and Steve and I had talked about that earlier today, that that's one of the things to move forward with soon. I, I definitely think you guys should take a look at that and come back with a yeah. recommendation on that. All right, I think anybody have anything else? All right, I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, we're going to move into old business. Ordinance 05 2021, text minimum buffer yard requirements for non single family dwellings and residential zones. Second reading. I'll read the top of it. Uh, town Council of Centerville, Ordinance 05 2021, an ordinance of the Town Council of Centerville to amend the town zoning ordinance codified in Chapter 170 of the town code to create setback and buffer yard requirements between new uses and existing single family detached residences in the R1 and R2 zoning districts and for any non-residential use in the R3 zoning district. This is a second reading. It will be going before the Planning Commission, I believe, next week. Is that correct? Yes. And then we have a public hearing sometime early May? May 6. Okay. I don't think there's anything else on that unless anybody has something specific. All right. Uh, resolution 03-2021, comp time payout. This was initially brought up. Uh, I was actually out that night, but we have made some decisions regarding the budget. Does anybody have any questions? Or Steve, do you want to go over anything? Or are we ready for uh, a motion on this? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've really had anything new to, to share. I mean, the council uh, was presented this information before, and uh, um, you know, it, the intent was to come up with a, a cap on the uh, on the amount of hours uh, that the employees would earn, and then it would get paid out annually, so that we wouldn't have a carryover. So, okay. And I'll make a motion to approve resolution. 3-2021 for the purpose of adopting a compensatory leave payout policy. Second. Oh, we have a motion and a second to, to approve resolution 03-2021. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. 2021 fireworks. Um, I would actually like to delay the report on the fireworks and we don't we haven't met since the last time the council met so we have a meeting scheduled for april 27th so the may 6th meeting will i, I actually have something to report i did listen to the rest of the commissioners meeting the other night and they did they did vote to approve the five thousand dollars so yes. hey. yeah and i did hear back from the board of ed we do have the um we have it at all and we're going to fire truck rides what's that i'm working on your fire truck rides too right Awesome. Correspondence, there's nothing on my desk. Uh, report of boards and commissions, Centerville Park. Uh, didn't did we have something held over in correspondence from earlier in the meeting? That'll be under, uh, that'll be under uh, oh, citizens, citizens forum. Yeah, believe. I do have an email that I received today for citizens' comment. Okay, I sorry. was waiting until after um, Carter Farm, because it's related to Carter Farm. Yep. Uh, report of boards and commissions, Centerville Park Advisory Board. Yes, um, so the park uh, Parks Board met via Zoom again this month. Um, couple things to note is that the old swing set should be installed at the uh, wharf park uh, within the next month. Um, so I'm sure when Kip comes back, I'll have some updates on that. Um, and then regarding Arbor Day, uh, we will be planting two holly trees in honor of Jack and Nancy Covert. And that will be Friday, April 30th at Centerville Elementary School. And we're just waiting to finalize the time on that. Excellent. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council of Governments? Uh, I have nothing. The, uh, the meeting got canceled last night for lack of Agenda. items to discuss. You know, I, I actually think that based on the meeting with the commissioners the other night, I almost think we should see if we can write a letter or have everybody who's, who's in the COG write a letter to the commissioners about, you know, how they said one thing and they did another. Agree. <laughs> 
Maybe at, maybe at the next meeting you can bring that up. Yep. I will. There will be one in May, though, because there's an okay. um, election of officers. Okay. Uh, Maryland Municipal League. Nothing to report, except I hope Carolyn found a substitute for me. Not yet. We will. We'll figure out something. <laughs> I'm going to see my grandchildren for the first time in a while, so. I see how it is. Thank Just you. Doing good All right, Centerville Planning Commission. I don't have anything to report. There is a meeting next week. Obviously, we had Chris came in tonight, and I would agree with uh, Sharon that we've got more proposals that are coming up. So, uh, okay. is the YMCA coming? Yeah. At this meeting, at the April meeting. Okay. Oh, sorry. I've got a Centerville Economic Development yep. Committee update. So, uh, a couple things that council should be aware of, and that the, the town should be aware of as well as. The Centerville Economic Development Committee is hosting Derek White from the YMCA Chesapeake at the Y River Upper School. And this is next Tuesday, April 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, the business community has been invited. This is something that uh, we think is important for the community to come learn about the plans for the new YMCA and certainly uh, be able to ask questions of Derek. And I assume he'll have more members of his team there as well. Um, COVID protocol, social distancing mask will, will be required. Uh, the second thing of note from the economic development team is that WBOC Channel 16 will be highlighting Centerville on their Delmarva Life show to air on Thursday, April 22nd at 5 p.m. That's That was three hours ago. <laughs> but I assume, I assume it will be uh, re-aired, so keep an eye out on that. No, next 22nd? Is it, yeah, see, next, I don't even know. Next it's, Thursday. It's, uh, it's next <laughs> It's next Thursday. Back to the future. And, and the, I believe they're, they're docs. And they're, yeah, they're right? including docs. Yeah, so uh, the program features six centerable businesses, including docs. And uh, Docs Riverside invites the business community to join them to watch the program. Next Thursday, 5 p.m. at Docs. Perfect. Not, not today. You said Tuesday <laughs> the 20th at WRUS. Yep. yep. Okay. And I just had one thing to add yeah. that I forgot to say is when we find out the time for um, the Arbor Day celebration, the Parks Board just wanted me to extend an invitation to all of the council to come out and join. So I'll let it you is guys a great, know. It's a great thing, and the kids are going to come, and it's so much fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, they get to get their hands dirty. I mean, it's it's a great, great time. Yeah. Keep your eyes out in your emails. Cool. All right, thank you. Next report of Department Heads, Town Manager. Yes, uh, what I have before you tonight is uh, um, on Windsor uh, Avenue, we have uh, a newly created lot between uh, two existing residential lots. They've submitted a building permit application because the council approves the sewer and water allocation. Um, what I'm asking is your approval for that allocation for that uh, uh, residential lot so they can uh, be granted their uh, building permit. I want to make that motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. One, one single. One allocation. Tank. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Aye. Seconded the motion. Jeff. Okay. And other than uh, continuing to work on budget over the last uh, uh, time since we, we met, uh, that's the focus of what we've been doing. Okay. Thank you. Chief? In your packets, you'll find the March 2021 department overview, uh, which outlines our criminal traffic. Uh, and complaints and incidents, which this police department responded to. You also find exhibits A, which is calls for service totals by month, gives you a comparison of how we're progressing through the year. Exhibit B, which is a three year comparison, calls for service. And then finally, uh, exhibit C, D, and E, which provide an analytical summary of traffic safety and enforcement. I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of the council may have regarding those documents. I love seeing this data. I really appreciate it. Anybody have anything? No questions. Oh, okay. Chief. Thank you. Thank you very much for last Friday. I think the first annual award ceremony for our town of Centerville Police was fantastic. And I understand uh, a young lady was responsible for that, our newest employee. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Great job. Great job. All right, town attorney. I have nothing. All right. Director of Public Works, uh, do you need to fill anything in there, Steve? No? Okay. No. Human Resources Manager? I have nothing. All right. No finance officer tonight. Town clerk? Um, we signed the agreement for Snag-a-Slip 
So we are going to start working on the onboarding of information. I got the uh, logos and that sort of thing to look at signs to put up down there and get our information uploaded on their website and our, our website. And, and uh, Carol had a good update today on, on Main Street, yes. some of the extra funding we've got there. Uh, you don't have to necessarily go into it, but it's going to be on our website. And you buy a gift card, you get a, you get some free. Yeah. Free so money part as well. of the the Siri money that we that grant that uh, Carol received, um, she had that earmarked for um, um, for the gift card program that she implemented right before Christmas. So. Um, this money would cover the cost to purchase a gift card. So I think it's like a dollar or it's a certain percentage for every dollar that you purchase in a gift card. So this money will cover those charges. And then you will also receive a, um, a, a bonus, right? a bonus card. Thank you. A yeah. Bonus wouldn't come to me, a bonus card for a certain amount. So I think it's, for a hundred dollar gift card, you get a forty dollar bonus gift card. Um, so now is a good time to purchase your gift cards. The link is on the town's website. Mother's Day is coming up, <laughs> so um, yeah. Great. Right, also, I'd like to congratulate Ka uh, Carol for the mini grants. The second round is going out. Yeah, second round is going to go out. Um, she is. Um, uh, we've got the first round all done. We're just collecting information so we can get checks cut. You guys will probably see that in the next um, check round next week, all those checks. Um, and then we'll open up the, yeah, we have the second round getting ready to open up. And the first round focused on the core of the town? Main Street. Yes. yes. And now the Main second Street. round is moving outward. We'll be uh, moving out of the Main Street area and anyone who was in Main Street who didn't apply the first time. Right. So right. when we say moving out, that means out to Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania is actually part of Main Street. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Pennsylvania, so, Pennsylvania Avenue. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue. Avenue. Yes. yes. <laughs> Not, Not Pennsylvania. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Just making sure. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> Keeping you honest. <laughs> All so right, outside of the central business district is basically what so it's it been a big success i i can assume i was very pleased to see her email yeah 36 35 36 applications we received and we so. made all the grants to them mini grants from 2000 to 3500 was that I, that the number I, sounds, about right. sounds about right yes i can't yes, remember that, that is yeah. carol should be applauded for a wonderful mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. yes I will pass it on if she's not watching right now. I'll pass it All on. Right. <laughs> All right, next we're going to move into Citizens Forum. Is there anybody uh, here that wants anything to say? All right, uh, you have an email that you want to read? Yes. So I received an email this morning from Rachel Carter Goss, I believe is how she says her last name. Um, I'm writing this morning to show support for the proposed development of Chesterfield. This is my childhood home. My hope after speaking with Rebecca Flora is that the town will approve the request for her group to create an agra neighborhood on the property it has been sitting unused for too long i plan to attend the meeting this evening and she, i did actually um email back and forth she was planning on attending but i think rebecca said she's not feeling well so um and she just wanted to pass those comments on to the council perfect thank you all right council roundtable ananaya nothing to add all right keel is there a, you know how the state highway does the tour, their tour with the, the commissioners? Do we ever get invited to that? Yes. Because we, we do? need, yes. huh? Okay. Yeah, typically okay. the, the town does get invited, yes. Okay, because I have a request. 213 from Millstream out to 301. That road is horrible. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> huh? Yeah, Joe's been asking for two years. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. I'll, I'll be looking. Hey, which road? 213. 213. 213. Okay. From the mill stream to, and they just replaced a crossroad pipe right there by the 7-Eleven, so now it's even worse. Yeah. yeah. And the intersection of um, Frederick Drive in 213, there's more potholes there than a little bit, so I'll be looking for it when, I think, I can't remember when it is. It's usually they drive in, that. Usually in October. Okay. Yeah. Symphony Village would be very pleased if that was uh, paved. 
if the council, you know, if the council would like to, you know, send, send a letter, send a letter you know, just asking for them to. Uh, I would hope we would. Yeah. Sorry. So would the council like, you know, to send a letter based on. Yeah, absolutely. Council Member Keel's request. Yeah. Thank you. Strongly worded. Yeah. Council Member Hardy. Yes, I did oh, well, send a. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you, were you finished? Yeah, I'm finished. Okay. That's it. I did send an email to Carolyn, and I believe CC'd Steve that uh, Andre Di Mattia of Talkie wishes to make an appearance before us on April 29th, if we agree. May and 6th. May 6th. May 6th. May 6th? Yeah, that's okay, the next you... council meeting. Okay. You know, uh, there's no meeting on the 29th. Okay, but he floated the 29th and I just relaying. He wants to tell us what, now that he's moving forward at Northbrook, what is his plans for the rest of the town? I've been uh, trying to make, trying to get him to pin him down because there's a lot of anxiety in the town about fiber. Optic technology. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. And I have nothing. Oh, I have given Mr. Klein. <laughs> I apologize. I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> now you know you've got the last word. So. I, I, I yield back my time. Oh, come on. You've got to say something. No, no. All right. I'll take a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> we got a motion, we got a second. <laughs> All right, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye.